Plato said that when you go to chemistry school, you become more alert. You, you may wake up, your spirit wake up. And you become a more human being. That's your character is built in a school. Yes, 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 indeed. Peace. ATM Hotel, welcome and peace to the Seshu channel. This is your brother Wujau Meneb Edimaat. And just want to say peace. Shout out to everyone who is tuned in. And as I, you, you know, if you've been around at any point in time, you know that um, we'll do drive bys just like right now, coming out of the clear blue sky uh of newt and out of the deepest ocean of none <laughs> as you hear me always say but uh peace to everyone shout out to everyone um in the chat just taking a glance at the chat before i jump in uh see we have uh, afro ninja jama vyasa hotel peace buxy peace zane peace demo is in the house peace Peace, peace, peace. All right. And anyone else I may have missed, um, I just don't. Oh, Brother Donnie, peace to you. Um, anyone else who's tuned in, you know, just uh, type in the chat. Uh, say your peace, give your greetings, give your shout out. Brother Lamar, peace. Donnie C, peace. Oh, we got two Donnie. Got Donnie C, Donnie, Donnie Williams. All right. Have to remember that. Just giving everybody a shout out, give people a chance to um, whoever's going to tune in, you know, tune in. Um, but first, let me uh, let's see if I can grab this comment. I actually can't grab the comment. Somebody made a comment before I actually got started. And. Well, let me just tell you the title of the show. The title of the show is The Mother of Egypt, A Lesson for Chief X. Um, as you know, I've done a previous show not too long ago. Um. And shout out to Chief X, uh, by the way. I did a previous show and put Chief X in the name in the title um, as well because uh, these this show and the show that I have his name in it, you know, I'm giving credit to where credit is due. And I'm going live here um, by being inspired by Chief X. So I'm going to use Chief X as a use case again. It's going to be a lesson for Chief X. Um, but somebody had asked me or asked early before I started um, 
Richard T. He asks, will Chief X be a part of the panel? Why don't you guys have a sit down discussion? And so hopefully, Richard T., you're still listening. Um, the very fact that you asked that um, question, you know, makes me believe that you're you're um, not familiar with um, all of the history of the conversations and, and all of the dialogue on Facebook, um, you know, throughout the years um, on different topics and things like that. So um, Chief X by now should know better than the things that he said, which which inspired me to do this do this show, which you'll find out in a second. And so, you know, I'm using Chief X statement as a teaching tool. I've given up on um, getting through to Chief X on some of these topics because I've I've had Chief X on the panel. I've we've we've kind of volleyed back uh, a few times on Facebook. I've been on his um, live. He's come over here on this live and everything. But yet he still says things that are just incorrect. And so at this point, I have to, you know, you have to draw a line and say Chief X is just simply lying on certain things. And um, and so he mentioned my name in a live stream, which I'm going to play a, a, a snippet of it. And um, and he's just straight lied. So Chief X is lying in this regards. Um, I don't, I don't want to go as far as to say he's a liar because, you know, I'm not sure of his, um, lying patterns, but when it comes to, um, the statements he made, he's just lying. And I can't even say he's making a mistake. That's gone out the window. That's that, that ship has sailed, you know, because anyone knows me, anyone's been around, they know that I am very patient, very toler tolerable two things and I will try to solve I will I will have a conversation and have many many conversations and Chief X just not going to get it but he continues to um, make the statements and make the claims that he makes and he just happens to throw my name in it this time you know at best just leave me out out of the shenanigans I'm not for that circus immature bad character drama attention grabber pom-poms in the air kicking and screaming for attention type stuff i'm just not down with that i'm not down with the circus community and all the shenanigans i don't do that wujao is not that so if you're gonna do it fine i'm not i don't knock it because that's entertaining and a lot of people want to be entertained i like entertainment myself that's fine just don't include me in all that shenanigans all right so that's what this show is going to be about. But I'm going to try to be brief as possible because it's very late. All right. So, again, shout out to everybody. Did I miss anybody? Uh, I guess not. Uh, we got a few Russian bots up in here. Shout out to the Russian bots uh, in the chat. Mark White TV, peace to the panel in the chat. All right, peace to you. Okay, so let's just dive in. Uh, before I dive in, though, let me um, bring on my co-host here any words hold up hold up um yeah just i'm um, looking forward to you know seeing and learning uh, from you know uh, the mistakes by chief x all right so you know short and skinny back to that question um you know if chief x in the in the in the chat Fine. You know, I always post the panel link up. Chief X is invited, but I don't break my neck. I mean, like I said, you have to understand the history. I've, I'm, I've, I've given up on that. That that ship has sailed. All right. But I'm definitely using Chief X as a um, use case. All right. You know how you, you, you uh, <laughs> study uh, a study case. Um, all right. So let's just jump in. All right. So the title of this show is The Mother of Egypt. A lesson for Chief X. All right. So if he's not going to see it now or he's not on the panel uh, when I do post the link. Um, matter of fact, I'm not even going to assume he's going to see it because if he sees it, he's not going to he's not going to understand or pay attention. All right. That's that's where I'm at with it. He's just not going to understand. He's not going to get it. As many videos as I've, as I've done on this topic and throughout the years. Presentations. 
he is not going to get it. All right. I'm not the one. I can't help him. So I'm here for you all. All right. I'm here for you all. So stick around if you have any questions. If you um, if you have any comments, I, I, I won't be paying attention to the chat just yet. All right. So stick around and, and post your questions and comments uh, once I wind up and I, I'll do my best to be um, brief as possible. All right. Uh, Emmy Cat has posted the panel link. So if you want to jump on the panel now, that's perfectly fine with me. And I'll let you know when I open the mic up. All right. This goes for anybody. Every, any and everybody is invited on the panel. All right. First come, first serve. We get 10 people uh, on the panel at a time. All right. So I'm just going to dive on in. All right. So let me share my screen first. Let's start off with this. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Here we are. Okay. I want to make sure it's big. Okay, so what you see on the screen is Chief's live stream that he did earlier. And the time was seven hours ago. All right, now it's an hour, it's, it's a little over an hour long. And I did not watch the whole thing. I just do not have the time nor the interest at this point um, to watch the whole thing. But at this point, at this timestamp is where, as you can see, uh, he has a, um, a 2015 video up. So this is Chief X stream. And you see Chief X here on the left hand side. But he's sharing his screen. And he's showing a 2005. Uh, vid two, excuse me, 2015 video. Uh, entitled Nubia, Egypt's mother. And brother Jonathan Magi of the Amara squad. So this this particular channel is. Uh, brother smash you know we, we refer to him as smash we refer, refer to him as the magi um or jonathan owens all right so if you are familiar with him definitely check out his channel you can see his channel name there smash Rock rockwell i believe his channel is under the same name all right but definitely check it check it out but on this particular show jonathan and i had a discussion about nubia because you know the brother jonathan is into into quote unquote Nubia and so on. You know, that's his that's his fo that's one of his main focus focuses and interests. And so, you know, I joined him on on his live stream and we had a good discussion. So check that video out actually. But let's see what Chief X claims about this video. And then I'm I want to address a few things. All right. So let me uh actually I want to make sure you all can hear it. So give me one second here. Gotta make sure everything is a okay. There we go. You all should still be able to hear me. All right, you all should be able to hear the video. So I'm gonna play the video. Just play a small clip. I'm not gonna bore you all with the whole video. And then I'll make some comments after it. All right. So you'll so you'll know what I'm dress, addressing. As I play it, please in the chat, let me know if you can hear it or not. All right. Just, uh, you know, listen, but let me know if you can hear it. On, on Smash, Smash Rockwell's Rockwell channel. channel. Smash, Smash Rockwell, Rockwell and Wujaru are Amon Ra Squad members. There's no more Amon Ra Squad, but they're members. This, this is, is the title. title. Nubia, Egypt's mother. Now, everyone will claim the Nubians are black folk. Women are out here come out there, the Nubian queens. So if Nubia is Egypt's mother, that means... The Amon Ra squad, including Wujaru, including Smash Rockwell, are trying to say that the Nubians and the Egyptians are the same people. I had to clarify that a year ago. You remember in my video? 
I had to show people because everyone thought that the Nubians, the Kushites, and all that shit, and the Egyptians were the same fucking people. Stop, stop lying. Here go All right, I apologize for the for the slight delay because I, I don't want any echoes when I when I play the video. So I have to you gotta bear with me switching back and forth audio sources. All right. So you all heard that. So you, could you all hear that? I want I want to make sure you all heard that. I think Lamar said he could hear it. Oh, and there goes Smash right there. Smash is watching. All right, cool. Hey, listen, the panel link is there, so you know we we could kick it, uh, if you got the time, uh after I, after I finish addressing these things here. All right. So anyway, so Chief X goes, as y'all can hear him. I mean, I, that's why I play it. See, I don't I don't do the he say, she say. I'm going to play it um, from the source. So he says that that now he didn't even play the video. He just looked at the title and look, see how he got it. He has it highlighted in blue. That's not me doing that. That's it. That's him. He highlighted in blue and said, Nubia, Egypt's mother. See, woo <laughs> Wujaru of the Abu Ra squad and smash. <laughs> Chief X is crazy. But he says that because of the title of the video, we're going around saying, one, that the Egyptians and the Nubians are the same. And because we said Egyptians are the Nubians are the same and everybody knows the Nubians are black, then we're saying the Egyptians are black. And then everybody walking around here, African-Americans, saying that they are descendants of, of Egyptians and so on and so forth. You're going to hear them. I mean, if I play more, you're going to hear them make all of these connections that are just not there. All right. So what I'm going to do right now, first of all, Chief X is a liar in this instance. I don't know if he's a liar in totality. But Chief X is lying. Let me put it that way. Let me be a little bit more um, uh, softer. Chief X is lying. And he's lying on me. And Chief X is out of his league. He is out of his lane. Chief X is going to crash driving out of his lane. All right. Period. Chief X does not study this stuff at all. Ask Chief X to quote any book on cultural anthropology at large or specifically about ancient Egypt and, and tell him to name a book title that he has read in full and studied. Not some YouTube uh, or Google lookership and, and searches and stuff. I bet you he will not be able to name any. This is not what he does. All right. So I understand his ignorance and the fact that he will just not get it. All right. So I've explained this. And the reason why I'm saying it this way is, and I hope Chief X pops up in the chat, but I'm saying it this way because I've, I've explained it in, to, to, to the public and I've explained it to Chief X before. And Chief X as ha as ha has acknowledged me explaining it. So for him to include me in his rant uh, earlier today is, is, you know, I don't know what he's on. All right. So anyway, so let me just go ahead and explain once again um, what is meant by Nubia, Egypt's mother. All right. But first, I have to take a detour, a quick little detour, and I want to show you all something because I'm going to show you a pattern of this mentality because Chief X is not alone. Chief X is not alone. All right, I want to bring your attention to this document here. This is a book called The Philosophy of History. It was written by George Hegel. I want you to Google, write it down for now, Google it later. Google George Hegel. He is one of the, the prominent early Western um, founders of philosophy, uh, Western philosophy. All right. He's in the early 1800s. 
he, he lived during the early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s. Mind you, this is the time period where Egyptology gets its genesis as a, as a, as a discipline. Egyptology is born when Champollion um, deciphered the glyphs, etc., etc. This is around that same time. So you have intellectuals. He's a German. You have intellectuals in that day and time. This is a mentality that they had of all scholars during that time of Africa. And so I'm going to read this. Um, hopefully you all can see this. Let me blow it up some more. So this is from page 109. This is again. Here's the title. Here's the author uh, and the title. Philosophy of History, page 109. The, the book is 485 pages long. All right. We're on the page 109. And I'm, I'm just skipping. I want you to I want you to understand this because this this mentality and stance that that we're seeing in the circus community by Chief X and others is a he a Hegelite mentality. All right. So. This is just some of it. So I have it highlighted in blue. I'm going to read it. Africa must be divided into three parts. One is that which lies south of the desert of Sahara. They refer to that as Africa proper. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything up above here. Okay. Pardon me. Pardon me. Let me get back down here. Africa must be divided into three parts. One is that which lies south of the desert of Sahara. Africa proper. Now we, we, we know this as sub Sahara. Okay. So, so they, he is calling Africa proper what most people call now sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the upland, almost entirely unknown to us. So he's saying that Africa proper is almost entirely unknown to them. With narrow coast tracks along the sea. The second, so that's the first division. So he said divide in three parts. The second is that to the north of the desert. He calls it the European Africa, if we may so call it. European Africa. Check it out. Don't y'all hear people say uh, North Africa? They separate Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africans and, and North Africa is white and this and that. Y'all hear Chief X? It's white. Watch. I'm going to imitate Chief X like to a T in a second. Um, call it a coastland. And then the third is the river region of the Nile. The only valley land of Africa. And which is in connection with Asia. So like the Greeks and many foreign people outside of Africa, when they talk about Africa, they always seem to divide Africa into three parts. The northern part, he calls it European Africa, the Nile Valley area and then everything else. The Greeks did something similar. The Greeks call the Nile Valley area Egyptos. They call they call the the northern coastal part and things Libya and then everything else, Ethiopia or Ethiops. All right. Look that up and you'll see this very similar. So let's keep going. Africa proper, as far as history goes back, has remained for all purposes of connection with the rest of the world. Shut up. It is the gold land. It is the gold land compressed within itself. The land of childhood. Look at these adjectives. Look at look how he's describing it. The land of childhood, which lying beyond the day of self-conscious history. Beyond self-conscious history, it is enveloped in the dark mantle of night. Now, remember, to these intellectuals, wisdom and knowledge was metaphorized as light, ignorance and stupidity and 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 not knowing things and 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 whatnot was night dark all right you know you know all, all you all you all should be familiar with the word illuminati illuminous the illuminated ones people people want to go into conspiracy theories but the the it, it had its meaning in um wisdom and knowledge the illuminated ones all right let's keep going I'm going to skip on down. Got some other thing, other highlight. This peculiar, peculiarly African character is difficult to comprehend 
for the very reason that in reference to it, we must quite give up the principle which naturally accompanies all our ideas, the category of universality. In Negro life, the characteristic point is the fact that consciousness has not yet attained to the realization of any substantial objective existence. For example, God or law, in which the interest of man's volition is involved and in which he realizes his own being. So he's saying that people in Africa proper has not elevated to the level of consciousness to be able to, to obtain realization of objective existence. How dare him say that? All right. This distinction between himself as an individual and the universality of his essential being, the African in the uniform, undeveloped oneness of his existence has not yet attained so that the knowledge of an absolute being and other and a higher than his individual self is entirely wanting. He's saying that Africans can't even comprehend anything outside of themselves. The Negro has already observed, ex, uh, oh, as already observed, exhibits the natural man in his completely wild and untamed state. This is how this guy is describing Africans. We must lay aside all thought of reverence and morality, all that we, all that we call feeling, if we would rightly comprehend him. So he's saying we got to set us out. Don't assume they even have feelings. Or reverence and morality. To comprehend these these Africans. There is nothing harmonious with humanity to be found in this type of character. He's like they're not even human. There's nothing harmonious about them with us. This is what he's saying, not me. The copious and circumstantial accounts of missionaries completely confirm this. So he's bringing he's he's supporting his statement now. And Mohammedanism appears to be the only thing which in any way brings the Negroes within the range of culture. Do you all see that? This guy. Is saying that if it wasn't for the Muslims, because they call it Mohammedanism, they're saying Islam and the Muslims, if it wasn't for them, Africans would have no culture. Do y'all understand that? So that's all I want to share with that uh, from that. And I'm setting a, a, a point here. Is that th now I could read more. This this book is 485 pages. And 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 by the way, I, I encourage you to get that book is long, but also get the get the book that addresses that this book. It's a book. Matter of fact, let me see if I can um, share it because I want to share the titles. Yeah, we're just going to have a little. A little fun tonight, so give me a second. I want I want to make sure you all are getting all this stuff. All right, so I'm going to share that. You can take a screenshot or write it down right now. But I want you all to get this book right here. Grab this book right here. It is called Hegel and Africa, an evaluation of the treatment of Africa in the philosophy of history by Ronald Q. Kendall. All right. Get that book because he actually addressed. Now, he's not the only one. But he addresses the sentiments of of the views on Africa and Africans within this book. All right. Get that. Get this book. All right. And there's many other uh, uh, critiques. There's a lot of people who who wrote whole papers and people got their uh, degrees in philosophy by writing about um, George uh, Hegel. All right. So I refer to these people with the same mentality as Hegelites. OK, Chief X is a Hegelite. He's not the only one. He may not know it, but he's a Hegelite. All right. These are people who view um, Africa in that sense. And you're going to see why. All right. So. Next. Um, I want to 
show. Let me see if there's anything else on the video. Let me go back to Chief X video. All right. I want to play more. Because, you know, he's going he's going to um, tell on himself. All right. So let me play a little bit more of his video. All right. Y'all bear with me. I got to switch the sound over. Make sure you all can hear it. Got to hook you up. Here goes Wujaro in the video with Smash World. Look at the title. Nubia, Egypt's mother. Well, I am what my mother is. I don't know about y'all. My mama's a black woman. I'm her son. That means I'm a black son. They're trying to allude to the fact that Egyptians and Nubians are the same people. For decades, they've been saying this shit. But they act that today, 2021, 2022, they're backpedaling because they've been called on their bullshit and they've been exposed. You don't think they're saying that? Here goes Jonathan right here. Another video. It says right here. The title. Another same title. Nubia, Egypt's mother. Okay, okay, so yes, yes, yes. Uh, again, sorry about that pause. All right, so y'all heard it from Chief X himself. So he's making conclusions based on the title. Now, he claims that we are backpedaling. Chief X is 1,000% wrong as all outdoors. All right, you walk outside, you're going to see Chief X is wrong posted everywhere. He's wrong as all outdoors, all right? Um, nobody's backpedaling anything. I have countless videos on this channel that you're watching right now where I explain everybody and their mother knows that I do not advocate the use of the word Nubian. I have a problem with using the word Nubian. I know what people mean when they use it, but I advocate correcting that. I did show after show showing people demonstrating that the problem of using the term Nubia Chief X is just not going to get it I've done Facebook post after Facebook post explaining all of this stuff about Nubia so I'm going to run it down to you all real quick uh and and I'm gonna make it real simple everybody's watching right now I I have confidence that you're going to get it you're going to get it all right so I'm going to share my screen Oh, I'm share this and I'm going to break it down to you all. Give me one second. All right, so you all should be able to see this live and direct. All right, so I'm going to walk through it. I'm going to be quick but slow. <laughs> all right, so I want you all to see this is a presentation I did from September 8th, 2018 called Egyptian Hieroglyphs uh, Kemet versus Nubia Kush. All right, I'm just showing you all the dates, all right, that I did this presentation. That's how long ago this was. All right. And in this presentation, I'm not going to do the presentation, but in this presentation, what I am stressing is the problem of the use of the word Nubia and how it's confusing the all the conversations. All right. And I offer a solution on how we can fix it to move on. I've been saying this for years, way before uh, 2018, but I did a presentation. This is one of them. All right. So just to skip around. Um, what I'm advocating is for people to stop using the word Nubia or Nubians when they're describing people south of Egypt because they were never called Nubians. 
The Egyptians never called them Nubians and they themselves didn't call themselves Nubians. We know their names. We have access to their names. The Egyptian records record their names, all these different various groups. So in this slide alone, I'm, I'm saying let all these sentences start with let, 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 let Kosh be what it is and let the people be who they are. Let Wawawet be what it is and let the people be who they are. Let Kent Nefer be what it is and let the people be who they are. Let Majau be what it is and let the people be who they are. Let Nahisi be what it is and let the people be who they are, etc., etc. Keftiu, these are the Cretans. Chehenu or Chenu, Libya, Nahisi. See, so if we start calling these people by their names that are recorded in history, attested that we have access to, we can solve this problem. We can solve Chief X is a problem. He has a problem. All right. Serious problem. So I go down and, and name all of these people. All right. So the point is that this is this is where the banana in the tailpipe has occurred. OK, now. Early in early Egyptology. They remember Egyptology was born in the early 1800s during slavery, the transatlantic slave trade. And it was born in the environment and climate of the Hegelite mentality. OK, so the scholars dared never and not and never to associate the wonderful land of Egypt, the mysterious land of Egypt, the land of the gods, the land that the Greeks propped up and gave so much props to. They would never give that accomplishment to people of Africa, black people, as we call people today. They didn't want to do that. They couldn't do that. So everything came with a bias. They came to the table strapped with bias explosive. They had a whole backpack, whole suitcase of bias. They unpacked the suitcase. Bias just started flying out. Biases, biases, biases. They just were extremely biased when they came to the table. All right. So I say that to say is that when they talk about people south of Egypt, they call them the blacks, Negroes in the text, in the scholarly works. Then later they swap that word Negro, which means black to Nubian. And I'm going to show you real quick. This right here is coming from E.A. Wallace Budges, uh, an Egyptian reading book for beginners. Page 450. You'll see this this term here. Nehes. You see the glyphs for the word here. Budge and his colleagues during that time period translate that as Negro land. We know what the word Negro means, right? It means black. So this is literally black land. And that's and that's a, a, a shot at all the people who try to say Kemet means black land. I'm aiming right at you. That's a shot directly to you. If you're going to try to run that false information that the word Kemet is talking about the land of black people and all this and that, then why don't you say the same thing for Ta-Nehisi or Nehes? Budge is telling you that that means black land. Negro land. Then you have another word, Nehes, spelled this way in the glyphs. This is talking about the people, the Nehesiu. He translates at what? Negroes. But what does that mean? In Spanish, negros, ne negro, black. So Budge is saying Nehes is blacks. And, and Nehes as a toponym or place name is black land. The land of the blacks. And the blacks themselves. So this is what he's translating as. All right. So the translates Negro. So let's move on. Here is a book of um, Archaeologia or miscellaneous tracts relating to the antiquity. Volume 52, issue number two, page four t 419. In this book, you see Negro land here again. So you see, we'll start here. The country of Wahwa. He has, uh, 
UA UA, but it's Wahwa, was situated in Ethiopia. To the east of the modern town of Korosko. It is mentioned in the inscription of Una. He spells it Una, line 16. That's the inscription. Uh, I'm going to get to him and show you that. Uh, he says Una, but it's really Winnie. Where it is described, where it is described as a Negro land. And he has it here. Wawat. And remember I said right here, let Wawat be what it is and let the people be who they are. This is the word Wawat. But it says Wawat ni Nehes. So it means the Wawat people of Nehes. What did Budge translate in the Hess as in that form? Blacks. Negroes. All right. So what am I getting at? The point here is that in this early scholarly work, they refer to these people and these, these places as black or Negro. All they did later after this was swap the word Negro for Nubian. So what they essentially did was they made Negro equal to Nubian or Nubian equal to ne Negro. And we know Negro means black. So Nubian equals Negro. Negro equals black. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So now Nubian equals blacks. And so that is the banana in the tailpipe. But now here's the problem. But let me let me just sh show you real quick this line, uh, these these terms here. So he says 16. This is line 16. You see number 16, biggest day right there, right? Um, you have Wawat. Wawat right there. Wawat. Didn't mean to move that. Wawat ni Nehes or Nehes. So I want you to see this pattern of glyphs here. Even if you can't read the glyphs, I'm not trying to um, give a, a, a hieroglyphic lesson tonight. But just look at this pattern. You have the water ripple, the twisted flax folded cloth, and you have C three, excuse me, three seated um uh people figures here with a beard and a feather on their head three of them look at this pattern this spells nahis all right or as budge has nahes now look at the pattern here same thing look at the pattern here same thing pattern here just left and you see the pattern here so it's one, two, three, four times on this page. And right in front of it is a place. So you have Wawat Nehes. Well, guess what? In front of this is a place. Imam is a place. You have Jam is a place. And over here you have Kau is a place. All of these places, Kau, Wawat, Jam and Imam are all located in Ta Nehisi. And I'm going to show you Ta Nehisi in a second. But before I do that, well, let me do that now. Let me show you Ta Nehisi right now. Uh, where do I have the map? And here we are. So let me give you all a map lesson here real quick. Can you all see this good? And by the way, I apologize. I, I'm not paying attention to the chat right now because I'm looking at these uh, these images. All right. So bear with me. The panel link is is pinned in the chat. If you want to come in here, by all means, you can. All right. Um, OK, so this is an overhead uh, map of Egypt, of ancient Egypt with with its major cities, all the 42 gnomes and their names on the map. They're in circles. So you see. Um, the circle here, number two, which is the second gnome of lower Egypt. But I want to focus on now. We're going upstream towards the south into upper Egypt. And we're going to go down here. Does this look familiar? I want you to I want you to look at this right here, these glyphs. And like I said, I'm not trying to give a hieroglyphic lesson, but you have eyes. You see this lasso. Lasso, bread loaf, three hill, uh, three hills. Okay. Now, if I go back, you see the same thing here. All right. Wawat. 
Wawat. And it's, they actually spell it here, Wawat. They refer to this as Lower Nubia. Now, fact, there is no country called Nubia. There was never a country called Nubia. So you have to ask yourself, why are people calling this area Nubia? And what does it mean? I'm going to tell you. The same reason why we call the Middle East the Middle East. It is simply a region. There is no country called the Middle East. All right. There's no country called the Middle East. There was never a country called the Middle East. The Middle East is a region. It is a designated territorial region. And if you say Middle East, everyone knows what you're talking about. There are several countries within the region that we call Middle East. You got Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, Yemen, Saudi Arabia. I believe Turkey is included. Israel, Palestine, etc. Those countries are in the region of the Middle East. So Nubia is simply a region. That's it. It's a region. It's not a country. All right. Wawat is in the region of what is now called Nubia by scholars. All right. So I want to show you that. Now, this whole entire area. Uh, to the Egyptians, they refer to this area as Ta Nahisi. And if you look over here. On this on this map. It's probably small for you all, but you see Nahisiu, the word Nahisiu. And they show a figurine here of Nahisiu. Now, look what they did. Let me pull this up so you can see it. The Nahisiu, they swapped the word to Nubian. But I'm telling you, that's only because Nahisiu was first equated with Negro, Negroes, which is black. And then they swap Negro with the word Nubian. And hence, Nahisi are blacks. This is why people say Nahisi are black, 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 black. All right. You have Kush. So here's Kush, Kosh. So you know where we are. Kush, you have the um, Juwaj, which is the Nubian, de we call it the Nubian desert. You have um, Ramasu Meriamen here. You have Kerma here. To the Egyptians, Enbu, Imen, uh, Amen, Imhat. You have, uh, what else do we have? We have Buhen here, Iken here, Maha, which is Abu Simbel. People are familiar with Napta Playa over there, etc. So I just want you to understand this region here, all right, on this map. All right, so y'all got it. So, you know, like I said, I can't pay attention to the, to the chat, but I hope you all are, are, are following along. All right, so... Um, but I want you to pay attention uh, to this area here. Now, there's no modern um, border lines to be that can be drawn here. But the Egyptian border was usually at the first cataract, which is the first, quote unquote, water waterfall. Uh, Aswan. So we have Aswan up here. You have Philae or Wabet, uh, Abu, which is which we know as Aswan or Elephantine, Elephantine Island. And all the way down to Abu Simbel. We know Abu Simbel was part of Egyptian um, property and territories. So the so the southern border was dynamic. It wasn't static. It moved periodically depending on what time period and what king you, you refer to from Aswan down to Abu Simbel and beyond and back up. So the border swayed if you look at Egypt's entire history. All right. So this area, so remember this area, Aswan. Remember this city. This city is going to be key in a second. Kom Ombo. Kom Ombo to the Egyptians was called Nubit or Nub, Nubit. It means gold, gold town specifically. The people who lived there, if we were to modernize that name, those people would be called Nubians because they live in the city of Nubit. Gold Town and the people of Gold Town. All right. If we were to modernize their name today. 
So these would be your original Nubians properly used as a term, not misnomered as, as used today. Now, you have another city of gold. Remember Kom Ombo now. Let's go downstream a little bit. Here's Heracanopolis. Here's Luxor, what's called Luxor today. But in ancient times, it was called Waset. Uh, Waset. And you see the name over here, Waset. Oh, Thebes by the Greeks. But look at this name right here, Nakata. If you look in any archaeological book when it comes to Egypt, you're going to see Nakata 1, Nakata 2, Nakata 3. Even Nakata 3 ABC, Nakata 2, etc., etc. Guess what? This particular city was known to the Egyptians as Gold Town. Nub or Nubit again. You see it in the glyphs here. That's a collar of gold. So people living here would also be your original Nubians if we were to modernize those these terms. OK, now in the history of Egypt, everybody and their mother knows that pre dynasty, pre the unification of Egypt, that Nakata. Uh, people and the Nakata culture was there. Look where it's located. All right. Look it up. Nakata one, two and three. The Nakata culture. The, the, the one of the major contributors to what became later known as dynastic or pharaonic Egypt is the Nakata culture. The Nakata pottery. All of that stuff. In this area. You move on down. I don't have it on this map, but down here is another location called Kustul. You're not going to see the name on, on this particular map. It's referred to as Kustul. Look it up. Again, in that location is, a, is one of the major contributors towards making Egypt what it was. Everything we came to know or come to know and love about Egypt to this very day has its genesis in this particular area. Let me let me actually, actually let me do you all better. I'm gonna do you better. This region right here. I want y'all to follow. So this region right here, from the Kata on down, we could spread a little wide, even though people, you know, didn't. They weren't too happy living out there in the desert, but I'm just for the sake of uh, visuals. So from about Nakata, y'all see Nakata up here, right here where my cursor is. So from about Nakata on down. So I, I got to scroll down because this map is so big. So if I were to, if I were to pull out, let me see if I could pull it out over here. Okay, this would be a better view. So I'm going to show you all a wider view. Y'all bear with me. Y'all going to learn something tonight. OK, so let me um, shrink this up. OK, I definitely have to make this a little bigger. I know y'all like, man, well, Joe, I know you made it smaller, but man, that's a little too small. So bear with me, bear with me just a little bit because I want y'all to get a get an idea of this. I got to make it a little smaller right there. Y'all get the idea. So from about right here. All the way down. To where, see the, where the river bends, Nile River bends and kind of comes back up on itself? All of this. Maybe not as wide, so let me move it over. So about right here, this entire territory, this area here, is what scholars are calling Nubia. Okay? This is a territory, just not a country. But in this geographical territory, it is from this area that Egypt gets its genesis. Which means it's beginnings. The Egyptians even called the southern border, the first gnome of ancient Egypt, is called Ta Seti. Remember that word, Ta Seti, the land of the bow, as they translate it. Ta region, Seti, bow, the region or land of the bow. That's the first gnome of Upper Kemet. The very first one, southern gnome. 
on the other side of that gnome uh, during dynastic Egypt was Ta-Nehisi. So this whole area is Ta-Nehisi. So there, there's a line that comes through this territory. Remember, Nubia as a as a as a um, as a region is is an overlapping region. There's no country called Nubia, but Nubia as a region is split between Egypt today and Su northern Sudan today. So Nubia is a is a region that consists of southern Egypt and northern Sudan to this very day. Okay? Like in the past. So it's from this area. These people here in this area who dwelt in this area are responsible for the major contribution to what became known to us as ancient Egypt that we know and love right now. All right, and I'm going to show you. So when we say Nubia is the mother of Egypt, to reword it for the people on the short bus is that Nubia is a region. And by being the mother of Egypt means that that it's from this region that Egypt gets its genesis. Now. Let me explain. All of Egypt here, all of Egypt right here. For thousands of years has has been populated in terms of of human beings from multiple directions, multiple people, people coming from the Sahara, coming from the West, converging on the Nile, people coming from over here in the Sinai area, the Levant area, uh, converging onto the Nile all throughout early history pre-dynastic times okay so the population of the nile valley and its delta was a mixture of various peoples coming from different directions so i want that to, i want that to marinate so it's not to say um that all these people were one ho homogeneous people egypt was never a homogeneous people the population of, uh, of this area was done by multiple streams of people. So when we say Egypt or Nubia is the mother of Egypt, we're talking about the state forming aspect, what became known as the kingdom of Egypt, the administration, the kingship, all that state forming, the writing system, hieroglyphs has its own origin and genesis in the south kingship has its origin in the south the entire administration structure from the king the nisut to the uh chati the vizier or visor to the emira to the overseers all of that came from the south When we even say dynasty, the king, one after another, whether they be male or female, we know we have female, female kings, not queens, but kings in their own right. That institution, Nesit, is the institution of kingship, comes from the south. That's what we mean, that Egypt, that we know ancient Egypt as, has its genesis in the south, from this area, this region. That is misnomer Nubia. The Egyptians never called it that. It was never called that. They just, the scholars pulled a fast one on you and me. By doing that. By removing Egypt out of Africa. By, by removing Egypt and separating it from its genesis. And I'm not the only one that says that. And I'm going to show you in a, in, in, in a second. So I want to drive these points home because I want to I want to show you because I got to I got to treat uh, what I'm saying as if I'm talking to, you know. I, I, I don't even know. All right. That's why I say Chief X is just not going to get it. All right. Um, and, it, and I don't expect him to because he doesn't read. He doesn't he doesn't read this stuff. He doesn't he doesn't understand. And as, as I'm showing this on this map, it's just, you know, this is just googly guy. OK, so hopefully that that point is, is driven home. So Nubia being the mother of Egypt is saying 
that what we know as ancient Egypt, what became ancient Egypt, it's state forming apparatus. Now, by the way, this state forming um, uh, apparatus, the state forming started down here in this area that I showed you all that I had, I had covered and it worked its way upward. It's worked its way upward until it reached the Mediterranean. And that upward movement of this organizing state forming po polity of a kingdom, that formation moved up until it culminated and climaxed into what's, what we know as Sima Tawi, the unification of the two lands. Those two lands being Ta Mehu. And let me go back to the other, other uh, screen. Move this out the way. Told you y'all gonna learn something tonight. Ta Mehu is Lower Egypt. Ta Shema'u is Upper Egypt. Ta is the word for region, often translated as land. But if we understand it to mean region, we'll understand it even better because the Egyptians at all times saw that their unified kingdom was really a unification of two things simultaneously. Two ties, they call it Tawi. We we say two ties or two regions, but in their language they would say Tawi. Sama Tawi. Tawi. The we on Ta is a masculine dual. It means two things, two regions, Tawi. And that was the name of Kemet before it was called Kemet. It wasn't called Kemet until the 11th dynasty. Before that, it was called Tawi, short for Sima Tawi. It was also called Kenu, which means the interior or the residence. All right. So that state forming apparatus moved its way and made its way all the way to the Delta, unifying everything in its path. Let me go back to the big picture. It unified everybody. So let me show you what happened. So let me shrink this circle. Bring this down a bit. So now, mind you, this whole region, scholars refer to as Nubia. So the, the, form, the formation aspect and all that came with it moved its way upward. OK, and as it moves its way upward, let me see if I could pull this down. Just imagine this growing. So so the state formation grows and grows and grows until it reaches the, it, until it reaches the, the Mediterranean. OK, now, as it moves up. It starts to it, as it moves up. So if I keep this lower point here and just move the upper point and stretch it, you would think that that's how it happened. But as this moved up. The bottom, the bottom influence. Now, speaking of influence, sphere of influence, the influence at the bottom started to also retract. In a northern direction to the point where that at the unification of Kemet, the southern border was now at the cataracts, the waterfalls. It was no longer so far down. And what happened is the state forming process of Egypt to form the first dynasty, something similar was going on down here. And I swear I have to I have to do this, y'all, to make it simple. So now we have two distinct state forming aspects going on. We have what's taking place up here that we know as ancient Egypt or Kemet. And then we have a state forming process happening down here as well. All right. And this becomes your Kush kingdom, kingdom of Kush and these other small kingdoms that has smaller monarchs down here in the south. And then these people came became distinct and distinguished culturally, behaviorally. Dress. From the people up here. This is the separation of the Ta Nahisiu, which means everybody who lived down here, from the Remetch, the ancient Egyptians. 
People up here had a national identity, the Remech. People down here, there were multiple people, all considered by the Egyptians the Nahisiu. Why? Because they live in the region of Nahisi. This region became Nahisi. This up here became Ta uh, Seti. You also have Ta Meri. So remember, you have Ta Mehu, Ta Mehu, Ta Shema'u. You also have Ta Meri and Ta Seti. All right. So having said all of that, I hope you all are following. Now I want to get back to to me and my advocacy for over the years. And this is how how and why I say Chief X is lying. And I believe he knows he's lying. So I, I really don't understand it. And actually, I, I, I lost respect points for Chief X. Shout out to Chief X. because I don't have anything uh, personally against the man. But Chief X is on some next level. Um, short bus shorty stuff right now. OK. Now, the people who became the, the, the people in this area of Ta-Nehisi, right, ta all the people in this area became distinct and uh, different uh, and viewed differently by the Remech up here, okay? And so in my previous presentations, I even go inside of the primary sources, Egyptian text itself, to explain how the Remich saw their southern neighbors. Now, mind you, this is after the formidable years. This is after the Genesis. This is after the boiling up, the percolation of, of um, statehood and everything in that territory. This is after all of that. This is, this is after Egypt um, unified and the kingdoms are, are, are rolling out kings and everything. Okay, so I'm just going to go over just a few of these real quick. And hopefully you all can see it on the screen. Um, so I say in primary sources at times, the Remich speak of their southern neighbors, often referred to Nubians or Kushites as Beshtu, which means rebellious. These are people who are rebellious. Why did they call them rebellious in the first place? I'm going to tell you why. Because during the state forming process in its in its genesis, there were people who simply did not agree did not want to go through with that. They were happy with where they were, the way they were, and was fine. They didn't want to do it. So these people rebelled against all of that. So they were seen as, okay, other than, other than. Y'all, you know, either get down or lay down type of thing. We're, no, we're not laying down. We ain't getting down either. All right, and they were strong enough to say we're not laying down. Others weren't because Egypt, like I say, Egypt expanded those southern borders uh, at times where they just conquered, took over. They couldn't push down the Kush, though. But anyway, so I'm going to read this. Quoting. Like I said, I'm not going to give the um, hieroglyphic lesson because when I first presented this, you know, we can read all the glyphs and explain everything. But I'm just going to read the translation. One came to say to his majesty. The Nahisi. Now, I will point it out up here so you, so you all can uh, see it. Now, I want y'all to see this, these glyphs right here. See what? what? Y'all see that, right? What? what? I want y'all to see that. Okay, so yeah, I just want y'all to, you know, pay attention to that. Okay, so you see um, the Nahisi is descending in the area of Wawat. He planned... A rebellion against Kemet. He is assembling to himself all the foreigners and the rebels of another country. So now this is from the description of uh, Thutmose IV, the great grandson of Thutmose II. So what this is saying is that there's somebody who's reporting back and saying, listen, those dudes down there, those dudes in um, near what Wawa, they 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 trying to build up an army. They they get a rebel against Kemet. They build up an army. You see, it says the foreigners and rebels of another country. All right. So that's one. Let's go on to another one. Primary source example of Kemet's southern neighbors, often called Nubians. Now, Egyptians never called them Nubians. All right. I can show you what, what, what they call them. Uh, let me point to it right here. See that word right there? The Nahisi. All right. You see this word? 
Just remember it. Uh, being taught Rani Kemet. Now, Rani Kemet is the is the proper name of the Egyptian language. Rani Kemet. All right. So this is a primary source where people south of the Egyptians who were not Egyptians was being taught the Egyptian language. So the 18th Dynasty instruction of Ani contains instructions to a scribe where in one section, the author names several animals, including a dog, a monkey and a goose, and describes how they should normally behave, followed by a reference to the Nahisiu. And it says, one teaches the Nahisiu the language of the people of Kemet. And I want you all to see. Medut Remich Ni Kemet. Medut Remich Ni Kemet. As you see right here. All right. Uh, the language of the people of Kemet, the Karu and any foreign land likewise say, I will act as all animals. You should listen and you should learn what they do. All right. Just wanted to show you that example. Give me, let's give you another one. So my point here is that this is an old presentation. I'm just sharing with you all some some of these things. If if any if I was saying that these people are the same as the Egyptians, why would I point out how much the Egyptians are making a distinction between themselves and these people? That's retarded. But the problem, which I say Chief X is never going to get is because these people are not called Nubians, but by the Egyptians, that is. But people who don't study this and don't read, they call them Nubians. The Nahisiu, remember, I showed you on the map. I showed you on this map right here. Let's move it, move it. Try to do this fast for y'all. They translate Nahisiu as Nubians. That's the problem. All right, let's keep going. Where was I at? Uh, that was Langston. All right, here's one from Papyrus Collar. We have various primary sources of how the Remish, the ancient Egyptians, saw and defined their neighbors. One of the views of the neighbors of the South, of the South, what most misnomer as Nubians here, a Remish official called Passer sends a letter to an unnamed dignitary to the South. He describes a scene of a tribute paid to Kemet. Now note the description of the people. Uh, Terek, he says, tall Terek, which is a group of people. These are these, a group of people who live in that region. These will be Nahisiu um, in terms of region wise of Ta Nahisi, but specific tribal. They will be the Terek people. The tall Terek people in lion cloth garments, their fans of gold, wearing long feathers, their bracelets with woven knots and many Nahisiu consisting of all sorts. This is what you see depicted on the walls when they describe and, and, and represent the, Nahis, the Nahisiu. People like to call Nubians, misnomer Nubians. Let's keep going. I'm going to speed this up a bit. In primary sources, at the time the Remish speak of their southern neighbors as Bashtu or rebellious. I think I read that one already. Oh, this is a different one. So they, they, this is a different text um, describing them as rebellious. So I'm going to skip this one because it's just um, calling them the same thing, but it's a different text. On the issue of language of Kemet's southern neighbors, we have primary sources, which is the cellular, cellular pap papyrus of the Remich describing description of one or more languages of his southern neighbors as being foreign to them. Why would they be the same people if the language is foreign to them and they're describing it as foreign? Why would I say that they're the same people? That's retarded. Chief X is a liar. Or oh, he's lying about that. I don't even be harsh and say he's a liar. The letter details a scribe's frustration with his stubborn student. You are in my employ. So you mean you are in my um, care. You're under my wing right now. As the jabbering Nahisiu when he is brought with the tribute. So this scribe is describing the jabbering way that the Nahisiu talk, which is gibber, we call it uh, uh, gibber jabber, because we don't when we under, don't understand somebody 
and what they're speaking and what they're saying because the Nahisiu are known for paying tribute and coming to pay tribute and leaving, coming and going out of Egypt, paying tribute. When they come, obviously, they're talking to each other, among each other. And so the scribe is saying, hey, listen, you're in my care, but man, you're jabbering like a Nahisiu when, you know, that we hear when they pay in tribute. Okay. Now, this description of the sounds of the Nahisiu language uses the same word that Remich used for the old kingdom reference, reference to the language of the Chahinu, the Libyans. The word ah probably served as an amiable imitation of sounds and words unknown to the Remich. Because he said, and here you see, ah ti. So it's like saying, ah, you know how we do that? Ah. <laughs> That's the same thing. And it seemed to support that the language of the Nehisiu was not familiar to the Egyptians. All right. Last one. Uh, we have various primary sources of how the Remage saw and defend, define their neighbors. One of the views of the southern neighbors of the south was, uh, let's see. Oh, favorable now. Find the Nehisiu of Cush. Look at that. Nehisiu. You see that? And see this word here? Neferu, fine Nehisiu, meaning, meaning good or beautiful, pleasant. Ni, you see, ni of Kash. See Kash, place name? Nehisiu, Neferu, Ni Kash. All right. Um, fine Nehisiu of Kush, fit for, a give, for giving of fans shelter. They are shod, which means, you know, they got their, they got their kicks on, their shoes on. They are shod with white sandals and clothed in fine linen. Their bracelets on their hands. All right. So they're describing them. And that's how you see them on the walls, right? Oh, let's see if I have a picture. A quick picture, quick picture, a quick picture. Uh, here, here we go. Well, you don't see the um, linen, but you see the bracelets and things. Maybe I have another one real quick. No, 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 no. Well, I'll try to show you something real quick, but I don't have it quickly. Right, here we go. Look at that. Paying tribute. Paying tribute here. Gold. Fine linen. Look at that. Decked out. Neck jewelry. Everything. All right. Okay. So with that out the way, let's go back to... Um, matter hand let me stop sharing that now like i said i haven't been following the chat and i hope you all are being patient with me and following along all right so next again remember chief x is lying and saying that the brother wujao is teaching that the nubians are the same as black and this that and the third but he doesn't understand what's meant because this is not his thing. This is not his lane. This is not his focus. And I get it. But he has no business opening his mouth about it at all. At all. I explained the title Egypt or Nubia, the mother of Egypt. It's this region or territory that is the genesis and formidable years build up of the statehood the kingship and everything from ancient egypt so now it's time for me to show you uh just that all right so let me go over here bear with me one second so let us go over to let's see what do i want to show you all first okay i'm going to recommend a couple of books to you all. Remember I said. Um, I told I mentioned to you all. Ta Seti. All right. As a matter of fact. Let's. Let's do this. Y'all should be able to see that really big. All right, you see this map? That's the same map. Blow it up really big. Really big. 
Y'all see my cursor? You see this? The first gnome of Upper Kemet. And by the way, if anyone's confused about Upper and Lower Kemet, why, why we refer to um, Upper Kemet as Upper and Lower Kemet as Lower, it, it just always think of um, altitude. Think of level, altitude level. Upper Kemet means that the southern part of Egypt is at a higher altitude than the northern part of, of Egypt, which is at sea level. Remember, the Nile empties into the Mediterranean Sea. So lower Egypt is literally low because it's at sea level. And upper Egypt is literally up, it's higher. Because the further down the Nile, outside of Egypt, you go down past Sudan into, I believe, Uganda and approaching Kenya and everything, you're going in the mountains. So upper Egypt is literally upper in altitude. All right. So the first gnome of the southern Egypt is Taseti. See this here? The land of the bow. Uh, it won't let me highlight just that. But the land of the bow, Taseti. What did the Egyptians call this this area? If anyone is familiar, uh, well, let me go over here. All right. Um, Taseti is the first known. So it it this region, the Ta was region, is here. Its southernmost region is Taseti. Okay, and the ancient Egyptians had cardinal points. North, south, east, west. They're different from ours. The ancient Egyptians had a different orientation. The Egyptians faced cardinal south with their back to cardinal north. So the Egyptians, uh, how we know this is because of the words and the language. The um, south, what we call south today, cardinal south, was to the Egyptians the head they call it resi, from res, which means the head or the beginning. Now, here's the thing. Why in the world would the Egyptians call the south the beginning if they did not have their beginning in the south? I'm going to say it again. This is all for those people who, who got so much to say, who don't study it and may not even know enough to, to that's what I'm saying they shouldn't be talking um the word resi and you know if I had time if I if I if I really took took time to to show you all all the glyphs for everything these words I'm saying because I want you all to look up so make sure you come back if you have questions or whatnot and you need for me to further elaborate I'll do it in another show I've done it before but I don't mind doing it again but resi is the word for head but we translate it as south because it was the south of Egypt. It means it's the beginning. But now on the flip side, the feet. So so imagine uh, Egyptians. Matter of fact, boy, y'all y'all gonna make me um, y'all really gonna make me lose my mind up in here. No, uh, let me. I'm gonna pull up something. So I'm, I'm gonna take my time. I, I, you know. Hopefully y'all have a little bit of time. We 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 in class tonight. We in class tonight. We in, we in, we in class. And I want to show you all something else. So give me a second. Let me pull it up. I'm gonna pull it up. Give me one second. Uh, MBK, you've been uh, kind of quiet. You 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 got any um. Commentary while I while I pull this up. Yeah, so I mean, uh, seeing that I've been, um, you know, we most of us have actually seen this conversation way before Chief X came into the scene. Um, you know, uh, going over these kind of things and then also have had experiences with um, Chief X, you know, and um, and things like that. I'm just, um, at this point, I'm just taking it as um, just, a you know, a 
uh, an exercise, you know, just to kind of like go over the, the things and make them stick because obviously we can't um, can't really change our, I mean, chief, chief X is, is, you know, chief X is chief X. So um, we, there's a lot of uh, components going on uh, that we have to understand when you're dealing with people like chief X at this point. Um, and you just have to um, <laughs> let it be for what it is. Some things you just, you know, you can't, you, there's not, you can't, you know, you can't teach uh, chief X for many reasons, uh, age, uh, intent, uh, there's a lot going on so at this point it's just good exercise i appreciate the exercise anyway because this guy these are things that we need to be reminded of okay and i don't know why it's not letting me um share at the moment okay um um, yeah, but speaking of uh, that, uh, the resi, I think we all, people forget we've done so much, um, uh, you know, on the topics. And I know when you're talking about resi and uh, the head and just orientation and things like that, we have a, 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 another video in our archive talking about geography. Uh, actually, what we did recently, just to remind while you're looking for, um, you know, your um, your slides or whatever it is you're looking for. Uh, we do we actually recently we you know we kind of clean up here and there a little bit so on this particular youtube channel um we've uh, arranged all the topics that we've had um uh, you know on as you know every every video under uh, you know topics so it makes it easier for people who are coming in and just looking for stuff so definitely you know uh, if you you know if if you're looking for something specific uh, on the channel, check out the, the playlist part, part because we, we've uh, done a good job of archiving that. And uh, we are also going to be doing that uh, for the most part also on our, our Facebook group. I know we've had, uh, we do tell people to to join and, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a good place where we will we ha have discussions that sometimes we might not have um, on, you know, on, on YouTube. As everybody knows, we're not so much regular on YouTube. We just pop in and out. But uh, you know, Facebook will, you know, that's a good spot for this issue. But yeah, so, uh, you know, since I see you got your stuff uh, ready, I'll, I'll shut up and let you finish what you were finishing. I appreciate that. Okay, so I'm um, just showing this real quick because, I, you know, like I said, you know, might as well, might as well do it. All right, so this is a, pres a very old presentation I did um, just to explain the Egyptian orientation. All right. And it's very important to understand Egyptian orientation if you plan to understand the culture. All right. So I'm not going to go into um, uh, anything elaborate, but I just want to uh, review something with you all real quick. So um, this is that map of Africa as we know it today. Right. When we look at our maps and you close your eyes and you visualize the, the world map, Africa, if you isolate Africa, this is how Africa looks. Right. Um, obviously, without the man standing on it. But this is the. Um, typical uh, view of Africa. So imagine these points here are cardinal points. These points are fixed north, south, east and west. These are fixed, meaning that they're not going to change or move these cardinal points. OK, so this man is standing in our orientation. This is how we are orientated. OK, with the north in front of us, the south behind us, the east is on our right hand side, the west is on our left hand side. Okay, so now, like I said, without going into uh, a lot of um, elaborate uh, things for tonight, because I'll do this again if you all want, uh, let me know. But I'm going to show you this orientation. Remember, the cardinal points are fixed. This orientation is how many other cultures are orientated. Where where they face the east and the north will be on their left hand side, the south will be on their right hand side and the west will be behind them. Now, how do we know this? We know it because of the cardinal, uh, the body parts, the words for body parts in their language. And I go over this in a presentation, which I'm going to skip. All right. But now. This is the orientation of the ancient Egyptians. They faced the south with the north behind them. The east is on their left hand side. The west is on their right hand side. How do we know? 
Well, the word for left hand is Iabit. I'll show you here. Iabit. Let me get my get my trusty um arrow out here. Iabit. It is the word for the left hand and the left side of the body, but it's also the word for east. You have south is resut. Remember I said resi, resut, the south, the head, the beginning, upper, elevated, upriver. This is the south. West is Amenet or Amenetit is the west, which is the right side of the body, the right hand. And the north is Mehu or Mehet, Mehet, the feet, the end, something submerged, something that is declined and down river. OK, so let's go back to this um, here. This is how the Egyptians orientated themselves. They faced the south. So. Now, what I'm going to do now, keep, let's, now, mind you, let's keep the cardinal points fixed. So I'm going to just turn this map around so that we'll be, we'll be facing up. But the, the continent is going to switch, which is what I did here. So, so this and this is the same thing. All we're doing is changing our perspective to move behind the guy. All right. So now notice how north is up here. But right here, now south is up. All right. So this is the exact same thing. We just we just moved the camera. You know, we if we were standing next to him. We moved behind him. This is how Egyptians are. But not only like this, this is how the Egyptians lay. If the Egyptians were to lay down on the map of Africa, their head literally would be in the south. Their feet literally would be in the north. Their right hand would be on the west. Their left hand would would be in the east so my question and this is what you need to ask people who don't know nothing from nothing is why in the world would the egyptians name the southern part of their territory the beginning the head why and the and the last part or the bottom the north mehu the word mehu means submerge. It's also another name for crocodile because crocodiles are known to submerge themselves in water. There's a crocodile deity called mehu. Ta mehu. And then you have people walking around saying ta mehu means white people. The tamahus. I straighten that out as well. Shame on those people who still teach that. That's false. That's wrong. The Tamahus are Egyptians who simply live in the Delta. They're not white people. This is the word Mehet. Ta Mehu is the region of the north. All right. Ta Shemau, the word Shemau means something that's narrow. That's the valley. They're telling you it's a valley and a Delta. Mehu is, is the spread out, open, submerged area, swampy area. And then the Shemau is the narrow area, the valley. There you go. The valley. We, we even call it the Nile Valley civilization. But we got to include Delta, Nile Valley and Delta civilization. All right. Spread that. But anyway, so I just want to show, show you all that. Why, why would they do that? All right. So now back, back to the business at hand. Oh, okay. I see we got 42. So 42, give me a second. Let me just, let me just uh, show a few things and then we'll, we'll open it up. All right. Appreciate you coming on. Okay. So let us continue. Let me go over here. All right. Now I'm going to recommend a couple of books here for you all. One is this particular book. Let me share it. Okay, this this book is um, a book by Bruce Williams. Now, remember that name, Bruce Williams. I'm going to say it again. Bruce Williams, B.W. Bruce Williams. Whenever you look up Nubia and the archaeological finds and, and its descriptions and inventory and survey, you're going to find his name attached to it in some form or fashion. He comes out of uh, the Oriental Institute of Chicago. And he's one of the prominent scholars 
um, when it comes to ancient Nubia, that region, again, there's no country called Nubia, but that territory, that area of coastal, of from Nakata down to coastal and further down, all the way down to um, later Napata and Meroe or Mero. All right. He's one of the prominent scholars in this, but he has several books describing the finds, describing the, the material culture, the artifacts and everything. This is one of them anyway. So I want to bring your attention to this is page. Uh, what page is this on? Uh, let me scroll up. This is the introduction, <laughs> page two. All right. So we're not that far in there. Now, I'm not going to bore you and read all of this, but I want to I want to point out. I want to make a point that. Here, let me, I'm going to start here. The great tombs of Cemetery L. Now, mind you, Cemetery L is in um, in the area of Kustul. And Emiket, if you can pull up uh, Kustul and have that on standby, I want to show you all where Kustul is. And I'm probably mispronouncing that word, um, Kustul. It says the great tombs in the cemetery L are to be dated sequentially, ending by the ending by the time of um, Abdul or Abido Cemetery B and, and beginning six generations or more earlier. L24 being about four generations or more before Ka. The tombs are much the same as Abido's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the trench and associated chamber present, perhaps the double pit design of these pre first dynasty tombs. We're talking about pre pre dynastic uh, times. Okay. Just to, just to put, put y'all on the timeline. This is before Egypt, before Egypt was, 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 was um, Egypt. Okay. Pre dynasty, pre dynasty. Um, skipping down um, here, the coastal incense burner, and the Horus of Nekin incense burner are royal documents and other incense burners with what Sorex are comparable with the prehistoric palace facades from Egypt. That's going to be important. The Sorek, the Sorek, and we could probably pull up, pull up an example of that as well, um, is a bona fide known Egyptian symbol and glyph. The word "serect" itself means to make known, and um, it is the the symbol that's used for the very first and oldest name of all Egyptian kings. The, we call it the Heru name because it's a falcon perched on it. Matter of fact, let me switch over to that real quick. Oh, you know what? In this whole time, I'm reading y'all, and nobody told me that I'm not even sharing my screen. That's a shame. That is a shame. <laughs> That's a shame. So that's okay because we can share this. This is a Sarek. All of you all should be familiar with this. You see the falcon perched on top. The Sarek is that uh, elongated rectangle or in portrait style rectangle with the name Jed or Jer, Ja in it. Yet you see the um, Cobra in repose. repose. That's a, a palace facade beneath it. That's a Sarek. And on the right, you see the word in glyph spelled out, Sarek. And it means to make known. That is the very first and oldest name of the king, the Heru name. All kings had a Heru name. All right. And by the time you get to later uh, dynasty, I believe by the time you get to the fifth dynasty, all the kings have five names. All right. So going back to what I was sharing. Let me take over my share. This is what I meant to be sharing with you all. Um, I was reading from here. All right. So this particular book by Bruce Williams now is called Excavations Between Abu Simbel and the Sudan Frontier. All right. Give me the name and title. By Bruce Williams. All right. Um, so again, he says the great tombs of Cemetery L are to be dated sequentially, ending by the time of Ab Abido Cemetery B and the beginning six generations or more earlier. So this is giving you a time frame. Now, I'm skipping down here, if y'all can see my cursor. The Kustul incense burner and Heru and Horus of Nekin incense burner are royal documents and other incense burners with Sarex that are comparable with the prehistoric palace facades from Egypt. The Kustul incense burner clearly shows the Nesu, which is a king, 
with a horse about four generations before Erie Hor, and a series of roughly contemporary seals and sealings from the other sites refer to the dynasty by the use of the same unusual form of a palace facade. One ceiling actually refers to name Tassetti. This is going to be interesting. Mind you, this is pre-dynasty, y'all. This is before Egypt. Okay. Um, one ceiling actually refers to the name Tassetti, the name used at this period on the plaque of Hor Aha from Abydos, the Gabel Sheikh Suleiman inscription, as well as this ceiling from Nubia. See that? Tumble the region. No country called Nubia that connects this particular form of palace facade with the name Ta Seti. OK, so now let me go over and show you all this. Um, what is what they're talking about? This is what they're referring to. OK, this is what's on the uh, a particular seal called the Siali seal. In that's located in the region of Nubia. But it mentions Tassetti. So where's Tassetti on here? So, so if I can get my cursor. Um, we see the bow. That's Seti. And beneath it is the word Ta. So, so this is one of the earliest known attested appearances of the word Tassetti. Pre-dynasty. Where is it found? It's found in the region of what they call Nubia. So again... When Smash, Rockwell, and Brother Wujao get together and have a big man discussion, grown folk stuff, you got children that will try to come on the conversation like Chief X and try to make a mess out of it. He doesn't study this stuff. So Nubia being the mother of Egypt is staring you right in your face right now. It's a region. These Genesis, these beginnings, these early, early attestation of all the things that we know, the iconography. Look, look at the king. The king is sitting on his throne right there. The king also has a bull's tail hanging from him. We know that the Egyptian kings uh, are represented with bull tail, bull's tails. Look above the king. You see the Sarek? You see that falcon right there? Do y'all see what I see? That's the Heru um, perched on the, the palace, the Sarek. Then look to the right. You see the big Sarek. You see the big palace with the bird perched on top of it. So you're looking at the word Ta Seti right there, pre Egypt. Where? In the region called Nubia. Hence, Nubia is the mother of Egypt. So does it make sense to y'all now? This is grown folk stuff now. This grown folk stuff. All right, I got to, you know, we got to have remedial short bus classes for Chief X. All right. Let's continue. Let me let me take this off the screen. And come back here. Let's see. What else can I get out of this um, particular thing? Do I need anything else from here? I just want to make a couple of points. Um, so what I want you all to do, though, is to look up the, the Siali seal that came out of Kustu. Matter of fact, let's pull up um, Kustus on the map because I want you all to know where this area is. All right. I want y'all to know where this is on the map. I'm trying to keep y'all on the phone. Like I said, we're in class a little bit. It's late. It's a late class. Not going to be too much longer. All right, this is Kustu. Now let's blow it up a bit. All right, you see Kustu right there in the middle of the screen? Where is it? It's right below Aswan, below Luxor. But right there at the Sudan and Egyptian border to this very day. This is this is a, a map today. Egyptian border. This is where these things are found. And guess what that area is called by scholars? Nubia. 
It's a region. This is where the genesis of, of, of everything we know about Egypt. Now, mind you, let me let me be specifically clear and detailed. E ancient Egypt, what we know as ancient Egypt was created by a list of things, a list of elements. The major elements were contributed by the region that we call Nubia kingship. The, the, the administrative structure writing the earliest writing is found in the region of Nubia the the ivory tags in Abydos or Abju the the cylinder seals the seals that we just now talked about found in Kustul this whole area was rich with all the things that that later became Egypt and made Egypt what it is. So, again, when Jonathan Owens or Smash Rockwell and the brother Wujau gets together and have grown folks conversations about this stuff, we know what we're talking about. But you know how kids just bust out the room, you know, kids supposed to be playing and they bust up in and trying to get in grown folks conversation. That's what Chief X is doing. All right, so we got to put Chief X back outside, you know, on the swings and everything. All right. And shout out to Chief X. All right, see, Chief X mentioned my name, and, and I don't appreciate that uh, in all the shenanigans because, you know, that's that's entertainment. That's the entertainment side. That's that's all the gossip and drama and everything. It's cool because Chief X is cool. Actually, Chief X makes me laugh. Chief X is hilarious. Seriously. I always tell him that. But he just don't need to be including me in, in those shenanigans on, on stuff. I know he don't study. He don't give it. And, and it. and it messes it up. It messes up for people to learn. And I don't appreciate that. So, Chief X, I hope you're listening. If you don't, you probably don't even get it anyway. All right. So what else? Let's um, let's take this off the screen. Um, OK, another book. Let me share this. And I swear I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be. Well, no, let me not swear, because y'all know me. I'm MC Iron Lung. I'm going to live up to my name tonight. Let me go the other way. I'm going to live up to my name. I'm going <laughs> to be MC Iron Lung. Okay. I want you all to, uh, let's see, I don't want to lose my page. I'm on page 88, but let me go to the beginning, because I want you all to see the title of this book. All right, this book is called Before the Pyramids. Let me blow it up. Before the Pyramids. And again, this is from the um, Chicago Oriental Institute, y'all. All right. It's called Before the Pyramids. It's, it's a, um, a book. It's 200 and about 280 pages. It is edited by Emily Teeter. OK. Emily Teeter. Now, remember that name. Emily Teeter. OK. She's going to she's going to she's going to pop up again. All right. This was written. What year was this? Uh, let me go back to the copyright. Uh, can I find a copyright? Let's see. Emily Teeter. Da, da, da. Okay, it's 2011. All right, 2011. Before the pyramids. Get it, y'all. Now, let me go back to my page. Where was I? Page 88. So I'm going to page 88 in here. Now, in, in this section, it is talking about these coastal incense burners. I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Make sure you all are seeing it. Good. Let me bring it up a little bigger. I want y'all to read it. The Coastal Instance Burger. Now, remember that? Remember that guy? What, what, what's the guy's name I told y'all to remember? Bruce Williams. He is one of the prominent scholars when it comes to, quote unquote, Nubian archaeology and so on. Here, here they are quoting Williams and Logan's 1987 work. That's the same Williams now. All right. The archaeological context of the Coastal Instance Burner which was found in Cemetery L. Remember Cemetery L? Tomb 24. They always call it L24 for short. Just so y'all know, it's an FYI. Indicates a date in the Nakata 3A2 period. They give their source. The shape of the falcon above the second boat is consistent with that date, as are the shape of the boats themselves, the boats. Other incense burner from the cemetery have rude Sorex. So he's talking about Sorex. Boats, processional combinations, 
but except for one is from Cemetery L, Tomb 11, they are cryptic. And again, you got your boy Logan and Williams. The example from L11 called the Archaic Horus Incense Burner shows a simplified version of the Archaic Horus on a boat next to what? A Sorek. Um, let's see. I'm skipping around because I don't want to bore you all with all the finer details. If you get the book, you're going to read it. Now I want you all to pay attention to A Group. Because archaeologists, um, they, done, they didn't give these the you know, these people responsible for these things, a name. So they simply refer to them as the A group. You may see A group, B group, C group, etc. But remember A group. A group is going to become popular whenever you study anything within the Nubian region. And I'm emphasize region now. It's not a country. It's not a people. It's a region. But if you study the things in that region, you're going to hear A group mentioned all day, every day. Okay, archaic, uh, let's see. Despite the difficult nature of the other incense burners' designs, they and the archaic Horus incense burner show that this procession is a normal part of A group symbolism and no blind imitation of Egyptian examples. The different tiers of tombs by size and wealth show that they were, that there were social classes. They're talking about this area, they had social classes and cylinder seals show that these classes had what administrative let's go to the top functions administrative functions although often considered egyptian imports these seals differ in design from those found in upper egypt lower egypt or southern palestine that means you're not going to find these things at that time period in these areas again i got to pause for a second when jonathan owens and Smash Rockwell and the Brother Wujao get together and have grown folk conversation. You got children like Chief X coming in, talking. Okay, when we say the mother, Nubia is the mother of Egypt, we know what we're talking about. All right? Again, so back here. Um, or Southern Palestine, and four examples parallel to the style and aspects of design on the Kustal instance bird. They got figure nine. We're going to look at it. One from Kustal Cemetery L, tomb 17, is, a, is from a very rich but secondary burial, burial, while two others are from rich tombs at Faras and Saras West. In particular, the Faras seal shows Sorex. They got that word again. Sorex. I'm telling y'all going to learn something tonight. The Sorex of distinct Kustal incense burner types. The rounded version of this Sarek also appears on the most interesting of these, a set of ceilings from the stone blocking between the two cash pits of what? There go that word. Nakata. Nakata 3A1. Date at what? Siali. Remember I told y'all look up the Siali seal and I showed it to y'all in the northern part of the country. There are many extremely, and they call this the most interesting there are many extremely interesting details on this ceiling, among which we should note incense burners with flames on them. All right. Uh, let me make this big so y'all can follow what I'm reading. Now, remember this incense burners with flames on them, a saluting man on a palaquin or chair, a falcon on a serec and a bow above a rectangle with rounded corners, a form of the land sign for Nubia at this period. See how they like to use the word Nubia? But it's, it's Tasseti. They translate, they, they call Nubia Tasseti, and Tasseti they call Nubia. Naming, here it is, naming Tasseti, the appellation for Nubia used for millennia. Now, here's where I take um, what do you call it? Issue. That area was never called Nubia in ancient times. No attestation. It was called Tasseti. I showed it to you. Even they just said it. They just said it, naming Tasseti. But so so they're constantly making this association, though. It's a region. Right, I just want to make that clear. Um, this ceiling puts a name to the country ruled by the Kustul dynasty. Let me repeat that. This ceiling 
puts a name to the country. What is that name? Ta Seti. Ruled by the Kustul dynasty. This is pre-Egyptian dynasty, y'all. Pre-Egyptian dynasty. But they're using Egyptian words. Ta Seti. All right. There's evidence that the Egyptians themselves recognized it as one of the lands alongside Ta Mehu, Lower Egypt, Ta Shemau, Upper Egypt, Ta Chahinu, which is Libya. Quoting the big guy again. There's that guy's name, Williams. All right, so I'm not going to bore you all. Let's keep going. I'm going to show you all what they're showing. You see this here? Um, this is figure 910, a badly damaged by fire, the archaic Horus incense burner that they were talking about. So you see the king. You see the Heru perched on, on top of a, a Sarek. You see uh, um, whatever he's leaning against. And so they mentioned that. And then another king here. And we can assume safely a bird perched upon a Sarek. All right. But let's keep it moving. Here's A group seals. Okay. Here's Kustul, Faraz that they were speaking about, Saras West that they mentioned above, and lo and behold, Siali, which is what I just showed you. We have the man enthroned, the king's bull tail. Oh, you see canines behind him. You see incense burners up here, what they interpret as incense burners. You see the falcon on the Sarek. You see Seti and then Ta down here, Ta Seti. And they interpret what's in front of him as a flail. No different than how this flail is here. Okay. We all know the, the crook and flail are bona fide Egyptian symbols that all kings held in their hand we know that the king's bull tail is bona fide known for as an egyptian icon uh, icon and item this is all before egypt y'all in the area that they call nubia so again let me pause for a second when the brother jonathan owens aka smash rockwell and the brother wujau which is aka me i when we get together and have grown folks talk and we talk about discuss this stuff because we actually deal with it and study it. You got children that come into it and got so much to say. Like Chief X. All right. He doesn't understand this and shouldn't be talking about it. And I'm only saying it this way because, listen, I have tried, y'all. Chief X not going to get it. And that's and, and I got to be OK with it. So th this is my therapy. OK, y'all bear with me. This is my therapy. Um. Okay, so enough of that. I just want to point that out to y'all. MK, you got anything? You got anything to add? Um, no. I mean, uh, you you did a thorough job of um, you know just breaking down uh, you know uh, what is needed to be known because um, and obviously this is something that we've gone through um, in different videos, but it's good that uh, you kind of put it together into this one video. Uh, and, and you know where I, you just walk down that whole thing like really slow walk it because like you said um you know it's you gotta do it i guess differently for the short bus crew but um yeah i, I don't know like it, it's good you, <laughs> it, the, the 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 education part that's good but so with um with chief x i uh, the only thing i got to say is that um you know, people have to keep in mind, uh, uh, you know, with um, even though some of the things that you say, I, I'm not sure if other people are aware, but uh, but, um, you know, um, Chief X is somebody that uh, when we say Hegelite, we actually do mean it uh, because um, I don't know if most people are aware, but Chief X will actually get uh, try to get white people to, you know, to kind of come and, and, and use white people to argue his points. I know for a fact that uh, Chief X has uh, was trying to get also this uh, this uh, white lady um, that's, you know, just run around different <laughs> uh, uh, black uh, groups, um, you know, getting thrown out, uh, being, you know, just being a hoodlum, basically talking about how. She's gonna tear up uh, black men's, you know, a new uh, 
behind and things like that. These are the kind of things that Chief X like because he, you know, he, you know, I don't know. This it's just higgly stuff. But you guys to um, keep in mind. Okay, but uh, yeah, I see you got something there, so um, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna keep quiet and let you finish because <laughs> I don't want to be. There's gotta be just one MC Islands. Okay, okay, so I'm sharing on my screen again um, another document that I want you all to check out. It is called The Location of Tassetti and Related Subjects by Samia Bashir Dafali, Dafal, Dafala, all right? And in this document, they, um, matter of fact, you get this um, from um, academia.eu, and you can take a screenshot and look that up. Keep it in your archives. Again, you know, y'all are um, going to learn something tonight. So in here, um, they speak about the earliest mention of the toponym Tassetti. If you don't know what a toponym is, a toponym, the word toponym comes from the Greek word topos, which means place, and onym, which means name, place name. And this is the, this is the argument we had about the, the place name Kemet. People are trying to argue who didn't even know what a toponym was. But that's a whole another conversation. All right. Um, but you got the earliest mention of the toponym Tasseti. And so I'm just going to read this here. It says, um, Meshu Kolombot Bot believes that Tasseti referred originally stricto sensu to the first gnome of Upper Egypt between two natural barriers, Elephantine and Gibel. Silsele, the first being is capital. By saying originally, she must have meant the earliest. However, I find this conclusion quite unacceptable for several reasons. One reason is that we have evidence for the existing of the earliest form of the name Tassetti in the so-called Siali seal impression. The original seal was discovered by George Reisner in a pit in Siali, which is south of Aswan. During his excavations there in 1907, the pit contained material and pottery belonging to his, his uh, group again, a group culture. The Siali seal impression was assembled from three seals and some parts have been corrected. The scene in the impression was previously misinterpreted due to a crack in the original ivory seal. And so here's that nice picture that we showed um, earlier. Um, and so you, you again, you see Tassetti. And so, again, I'm not going to bore you, but let's let's just read what it says here. And I'll read this next paragraph. The scene. Let me scroll down. The scene on the impression depicts a man seated on a throne facing a palace facade, a serec, on top of which is perched a, for, a, a falcon, Horus. Between the man and the serec is drawn a large bow, the Egyptian word for seti. Seti comes from the word set, which means to poke, to stab, to protrude. You know, so this is where we get the bow. You know, it's it's more so uh, with the um, more so with the arrow actually does that's attached to a bow. Under the bow, we can see a glyph in the form of a short and rectangular similar to the Egyptian word ta for land. The seated man raises his hand on a on the salutations of the bow, a gesture indicating a special importance of the bow. One agrees with Williams. Uh oh, there's that name again, Williams. One agrees with Williams. That the components of the scene, the throne man, the serec, the falcon, the incense burners, the altars, and the animals are good references to a kingship of Tassetti. Wow. A kingship to Tassetti. This is before Egypt, y'all. This is before the unification of Egypt. Wow. Let that marinate for a minute. So, again, when the brother Jonathan Owens, a.k.a. Smash Rockwell, and the brother Wujao, which is me, I, when we have grown folks conversations and we say things like Nubia is the mother of Egypt, we know what we're talking about. Boy. But then you got children come from outside, man, trying to trying to, you know, get into conversation. Boy, I swear, man. Mm -mm -mm. OK, so that's that. All right, enough of that. All right. 
Not too much longer, y'all. So now, here is, um, I'm going to show you all a couple of things because some of you all may say, some of y'all may be, you know, um, Chief Xites, you know, followers of Chief X and everything like that, uh, or Hegelites. And you may be saying we're trying to do the black thing because I'm going to tell you, I already know what Chief X is going to say about all of this. You know, he'll say things like, oh, you're just trying to make Egypt black. You're just trying to make it feel good. You're just saying this so that other people could feel good. And this, that, and the third, Wujaru. <laughs> and all those kinds of things. No, 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 no. So I'm not going to say this anymore, right? Because people will be like, oh, this is black blackology. Now, notice I don't get into the racial thing. I don't play those silly games. I think the um, modern social construct of race is a very limiting concept. And it has its place, but that's it. Nowhere outside of that. All right, so I don't get involved with that. I don't mention anything black or nothing except for the fact that the word negro, negro, means black. And they swapped the word negro with Nubian. So that's where you, that's where you equate this Nubian word with black. Okay, just want to put it out there. But let me show you all this person right here. Can't blame black folks now, boy. Mm -mm. Can't blame black folks no more. You can't blame it on uh on blackology. Do y'all see this right here? This lady right here that you all are looking at is none other than Emily Teeter. Remember I showed y'all her name? I told y'all I remember her name now. If y'all if y'all been paying attention, you would remember her name. She is the editor of the book called Before the Pyramids. She's right here giving a lecture and obviously I'm not going to play it. This is 40 minutes long, but I want you all to grab the title cuz I want you on your own Go to YouTube and watch this video. The video is, in, is titled After the Book, Before the Pyramids. And guess what it says? It's a subtitle. The Origins of the Egyptian Civilization by who? Emily Teeter. So she's giving a presentation summarizing the book. Okay. And in this presentation, she goes over everything I said from the book. Is she black? Can she be accused of blackology? Inquiring minds want to know. All right. So check that out. I, I don't want to play it because I don't know how the strike thing works and whatnot. Um, and everything. But but let me see. Let me, let me show you a couple of slides that she showed. Let me let me skip around. Let me skip around a bit. Look at that. She's showing that. As a matter of fact, let me, 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 I'll play a little bit. I'll play a little bit. I don't, I don't mind. Let's play a little bit. Let me switch my audio. Y'all give me a second. Let me switch my audio so y'all can hear it. I told y'all we going to class a little bit. We doing a little bit of class here tonight. Hope y'all enjoying your popcorn a bit. All right. So give me a second. Egyptian culture. The earliest features of Egyptian culture were retained, and they provide, again, the underpinning of Egyptian art and iconography for the next 3,000 years. To give you a couple quick examples of this, this is a plaque that's in the exhibit. It dates to about 3,000 BC. It's a votive plaque. It was left in a temple. 3,000 BC, 600 BC, 2,500 years difference. And you can see exactly the same sort of motifs. Or this, the Narmer Palace. I was up here talking 
um, what I was saying was notice that she she was um, comparing 3000 BC to 600 BCE and how the motifs are the same. OK, so she's comparing. And so she does this. She compares the different motifs and iconography and symbols and things and show you. All right. So she's walking that da does down. So I'm gonna let it play for a little while longer. Palette. We have a cast of it in our uh, exhibit. We couldn't get the original out of Cairo. Uh, they weren't going to loan it. Uh, but this is 3,100 BC. This is 50 BC, 3,000 years later. And so it is really. A 3,000 year difference. Same iconography, same conceptualizations. Y'all understand. Y'all are going to learn something tonight. very, very important to take a look at this period that was so very influential in creating Egyptian culture. Our show consists of about 130 objects from the Oriental Institute's collection. Most of this is excavated by British groups under Flinders Petrie. So I'm going to pause it there. I think, you know, you, I want you all to watch it. Check it out. Like I said, I don't want to play too much of it. I don't know how the strike thing on YouTube works, so to be a little cautious here. But you see the point. She said that all these Older things were so heavily inf influential on Egyptian culture or what became Egyptian culture later. And you're going to find it. Just read the book and watch this video. All right. So let's move on to the next thing. Uh, give me a second. Let me change my I'm move on to the next thing. Did I want to share? Now, mind you, you know, she's not a black person. We'll consider black so they can't run the blackologist thing any more on that so here we have something else here I'm gonna share with y'all another YouTube video and I want y'all to pay attention you see the name at the bottom Stuart Smith this is the guy right here Stuart Tyson Smith in the upper right hand corner of the video that's him he's not a black person it says black pharaohs Egyptological bias, racism, and Egypt and Nubia as African civilizations. Now, look, this is Hutch, the Hutchins Center. This is not done by the brother Wujao. This is not done by the brother Jonathan Owens or, the, or, or whoever else. This is their title. Egypt and Nubia as what? African civilizations. For those Mediterranean culture uh, uh, folks out there that be trying to uh, weaponize the fact that Egypt is on the Mediterranean Sea. Shame on you. Anyway, Stuart Smith. Now, I'm not going to play it, but but in here now, this one. Now, I want you to listen, write this down. I want you to, I want you to bookmark this YouTube video. I want you to watch this video. This is a good video because what he does is he shows in a timeline fashion the racial bias in Egyptology. And let me see if I could let me see if I could uh scrub and find a couple of things. Uh okay, so he starts to show people. You got Henry Frank Frankfurt and, and it's from him where things start to shift. But let me go before him. Let me go before him. Let me go before him. Uh-oh. Here's your boy, Petri. He's the one that advanced the dynastic race. That's William uh, Petri. Flinders Petri. Okay, that's your boy. Let's go before here. Here he talks about this person. And and see, you've got to watch the video. Like I said, I'm not going to play this video, but watch this video because when he's talking about Samuel Morton and, 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 and his colleagues, they talk about Egypt. They blatantly tell you that they're uncomfortable allowing Egypt to be African. They tell you right there in the book. They're like, nope, we take offense to even giving Egypt over to Africa and they say no Egypt is is you know not Africa they're separating Egypt from Africa right before your eyes just on some Hegelite stuff some chief Exodite stuff 
Chief X, the God Eagle. He's no longer the God Best. All right, he's the God Eagle now. I'm gonna call I'm gonna call Chief X Chief Eagle. Um. So anyway, so watch this video. You know, I'm, I'm showing y'all. That's that's that. And then he goes back. I can go backwards. He 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 does a good job walking backwards. Let's see, who else does he show? I think he shows Res Resonate. I know he shows. He shows these guys uh, right here. There you go. There's your boy E. A. Wallace Budge. So he so what this guy Stewart, the guy who's narrating, this guy in in the right hand corner, what he does, he walks through the timeline. So he shows you the the outright race racism. But then he shows you how it shifts a little bit. So Budge had a little shift, you know, but and the reason why reason why it is because Budge was more familiar with Sudan and, and you know, further down the Nile, you know, through his through his uh, dealings and and things like that. But I'm trying to find. It'll take me too long to find it. I thought he showed an image of. Um, ah, here they are. There they go right there. Henry Breasted and George Reisner. OK, Breasted. Breasted has a lot of works out there. Breasted is, is, you know, part of the American school of Egyptology. All right. So those those two guys right there. Um, and he's the one that started to deal with Nubia, the region of Nubia, Re Reisner, uh, in terms of these seals and things. OK, so uh, just kind of put it in perspective. Look at him showcasing uh, Ma, Ma, Maher Pep, uh, Perry as they pronounce it here, lying on the battlefield, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, watch it, all right? Tell you how to watch it. One more, share one more with, with y'all, then I'm going to open it up. I know it's late, but I say y'all going to learn something tonight. Y'all are going to learn something tonight. Yep. And if you come in here, come come on in. But if you come in here, give me a moment, and I'm, I'm opening it up. But uh, here's the last one, I think. Yeah, here's the last one I'm going to share for tonight. And mind you, the, purpose, the reason I'm sharing these things is because these are not black people saying this stuff. This is not what Jao was saying. This is not Jonathan Owen saying it. And I keep saying me and Jonathan because Chief X had the audacity to speak my name out of his mouth in some shenanigans. I don't appreciate that. I don't get down with the circus community like that. You know, this is about education and teaching and, and people sharing and, and walking away with growing. Not some, you know, gossip. Chit chat. All right. So here we are. With. Miss Vanessa Davies. All right. She is an Egyptologist. Um, and author. OK. She's clearly not black. But she has a five minute video. Now I want you to to watch this video. It's entitled Ancient Nubia Now. Well, that's the that's the uh, the, the series. The series is called Ancient Nubia Now. OK, because they have other speakers who who speak on this topic too but this specific episode or 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 clip is called how egyptologists removed ancient egypt from africa you know she might as well just say how chief x removed ancient egypt from africa you might as well just put chief x names there and everybody else like chief x you got some people on the pseudo killers that do the same thing they 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 they're just like chief x too OK, so I'm not leaving them out. I'm only mentioning Chief X tonight because Chief X mentioned my name uh, on his video and those shenanigans. I don't I don't appreciate that. But how Egyptologists remove ancient Egypt from Africa. This is a five minute video. So watch it. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but let's just see what she said at the beginning. Let me let me uh, mute myself. Egypt has always traditionally been given prominence as, as the height of ancient culture. Nubia is now coming into its own and is being understood to be 
of equal importance. It is different from ancient Egypt, but it is equally important and not just an adjunct to this Egyptian culture. What archaeologists do when they pull material from the ground or when they translate texts. Pay very close attention to what she says, y'all. OK, right here. All right. And this is probably going to sum, sum it up for me for tonight. And I'm going to open it up. Pay attention. They, they bring, bring their, their own, own cultural baggage to that interpretation and, and the baggage of the times that they live in. And so it's imperative that we go back and continually reassess the, the things that we take as facts. Many of the early archaeologists came to the study of ancient Egypt and ancient Nubia from the perspective of Semitic languages, or the study of the Hebrew Bible. And it was very important to them to bring Egypt specifically into the sphere of, of biblical studies. And so they had to carve Egypt away from Africa to bring it into that sphere. Did y'all just, wait, did, did, did I just hear, did, um, did y'all just hear that? Did y'all, was that, was y'all speaking? Was, was, was that Jonathan speaking? M.E.K., was that you? M.E.K., you, are you, are you a ventriloquist? Are you, are you playing games? Are you, are you, are you playing games with everybody? Nah. Man. Ooh, boy, I'm telling you. Oh, boy, man, I'm telling you. Okay, let me, let me play a little bit more. Play a little bit more. I'm going to play a little bit more. And the way that they did that was they used race. So these early archaeologists effectively made ancient Egypt white in this. Man, oh, in my, in my, in my, in my uh, student of another teacher, I'm gonna say, mm. or how how does people do? It? Woo! All them little sound effects. Did you hear that? They used race to do it. They made Egypt white. Man, did y'all hear that? Good. <laughs> Woo! Pandiri <laughs> play. They said, oh, run it one more time. Run it back. My goodness. That, that deserves a rewind. Let me, let, me, let me rewind it back a little bit. Y'all bear with me. Y'all y'all bear with me. Just effectively made ancient Egypt white in the sense that they made it part of a dominant Western culture. And ancient Nubia was separated from that. It was black. And this was how they took Egypt out of Africa and put it into this, this Semitic sphere, this biblical sphere. Okay, one second. All right, y'all should be able to hear me loud and clear. All right, so I'm not going to play the whole thing. Like I said, I don't know if, how these strikes work, but that's enough. Y'all can watch. It's only five minutes long. Watch that video. Watch all the videos I shared. Get the books I told you to get, please. Um, if you need them, hit me up. All right, I will be. I will gladly share because I, I have the utmost patience and appreciation for people who generally are interested in this stuff, all right? And so with that, I am going to stop sharing and bring on Asar M. Ka is in the building. We got 42, I think there's 42 tribes in the building. I can see the chat right now. We got Asar M. Hotep in the building. I just saw him say something late to the party. Asar is always late to the party. Asar, you missed it, man. <laughs> you you missed it, Asar. You missed it. You missed it when grown folks talk. See, me and Jonathan Owens, when we get together and have grown folks conversations, you got children coming from the playground outside like Chief X that want to talk and stuff. We got to say, nah, you got to go outside and play with your friends. This is grown folks business over here. 
We know what we're talking about when we talk about Kemet, Tasseti, Nubia, the region of Nubia, Ta-Nehisi. We know what we're talking about. We know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. Goodness gracious, though. Uh, but let me let me open it up, man. But uh, Asaram Ka, I think 42 came in before you. I think he was you. first, yeah. Go on, yeah, brother. yeah. So, so 42, you there? It's a good no, thing man. it ain't 49, huh? <laughs> What's wrong with 49? 49ers, I'm joking. Football. Oh, 49. <laughs> so, but wait, wait, wait. Before before y'all before before y'all say uh, something, let me let me remind everybody that the that the that the panel link is in the chat. Join the panel if you got any thoughts to share, any comments. I want to know what y'all thought. What y'all thought about what I what I uh uh um shared tonight. And and mind you, listen, I didn't pre um like this is not some presentation that I took time to put together or anything like that. I caught a glimpse of Chief X video, did not even watch the whole thing. I saw that I saw my picture really. And I'm like, what has he got my picture up there for? I listened to it and he had the nerve to mention my name and lie on me. He lied, y'all. So I'm like, nah, Chief X is is he's he's done. Like he is never gonna understand. So I'm not even worried about Chief X. Chief X, my man. Shout out to Chief X. I don't have anything personally against against him. I just don't appreciate him including me in all that shenanigans stuff. Um, so I'm gonna use him as a as a as a um, use case. He is he is a use case now to me. He is a use case. I unapologetically now use Chief X the Hegelite as a use case. Period. That's it. But um, all right. Go ahead. Uh, uh forty two. You had you um. You, you had anything? Uh, I want to say hi to the panel. And this is something I'd like to go in deeper to. Mm. Um, maybe at a different time. Because I'm on the West Coast and it's still kind of late for me right now. Um, but okay. I wanted to go into why I see Egypt as Black and African. Because it's such different reasons. With Black, it's one reason. With African, it's like 900 plus and there's there just new reasons all the time but with black it was just one day i saw a collection of images of ancient egyptian art that was so thorough that it took me more than a day during my during my day i was like on the bus and stuff to go through it and after looking through all that i'm like well you might say it's some mixed people or whatever, but you could do the same to, to Spain in medieval times or Greece or Rome. But if, if you're going to be honest about how you depict this culture like today, because this was right around the time a lot of movies were coming out, like God of Egypt and Exodus, God the King. I'd say if you're going to be real, then you, you, need, you need black people to do this. Or, or, um, or this is a, a fraud in this sort of way. Now, when it comes to African, and like I, I go, I go I, before I get to that, I would say that I think people who who disagree with this are crazy in the sense that I don't think they they could really look at all of that art and then turn around and say, oh, that's the white culture. Like I think they're they're basically ideology. And it is crazy, especially like with, with uh, black people. But whatever is in front of reality, like they're um, sort of deranged in that sense. Like they've taken on the we sick thing too. Now with African, it's just, it's damn near everything you learn about ancient Egypt, you find somewhere else in Africa. Like when I was starting to write about Egyptians, I had seen uh, an image, like if you look up God, Egypt, and penis sheet, there's an image of a guy. And I'm like, why Why are they, because I'd also see like other articles on penis sheets in Egypt, like what's, what's up with the stripper attire? Like what's going on? And it didn't really hit me until I learned like in the Congo, they got parasites that'll go in your pee hole. So I'm like, oh, maybe. So I, I did a little research. I found out like that's one of the reasons that they wear they wear these things today to protect themselves from that type of work. 
And I don't even think they have those type of parasites in Egypt right now. So they're they're creating an image. I don't even know why they think this is a deity, but maybe it's something that you could explain to me because I, I've heard one site that named the deity. So maybe a good project is to kind of figure out what's up with that God. But I think that's interesting though, that it's possible that they, um, the Nile might've had those parasites when it doesn't now. But that's like, when it comes to why I see them as African, it's so many reasons. But when it's why I see them as black, I just looked at an abundance of artwork to the point where if I see anything new now, it's usually stuff that's beyond the curve as far as like the features. So it's if, if I say anything new now, you know, chances are it's like, it's not something that that's, that's going to change my mind on that. It's not, it's going to go the other way. Um, yeah. But I almost well, never see anything new now. Well, that'd be interesting to um, to have a discussion on that because um, I, 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 I did, I saw one of your videos where, you did a um, like the gradient of the DNA results from these ancestry test kits and stuff, and and so so I, if you don't mind, I, I'm I'm gonna reach out to you, and maybe you can just go over that. Like you can come on on this channel, you know, and and go over that because I think that's a significant um, point that you're making with that because I don't think people see it that way, and a lot of people misunderstand their their own dna results um because of whatever motivated them to take these dna ancestry um tests in the first place and so they think that okay uh they like they like i'll give you an example if i go to 23 and me and get a um ancestry test done and then i get my results back you'll see people will share their results and they'll say well hey i am and then dot 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 so i am sub-saharan african i am 86 percent or 75 percent sub-saharan african i am blah 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 but they don't understand that number one 23andme as a company has a reference data set and they collect that reference data set from from whoever they collect it from but they fully disclose this on their websites and things but but what they're testing is a person's dna against that reference data set and then they they tell you how much DNA autosomally that you share with their reference data set. So 23andMe will have a different data bank as a reference set than Ancestry.com, than, you know, uh, MyHeritage.com and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So people don't understand that the, you, the way that they should word it is that I share autosomal DNA with, you know, these group of people who are living here, blah, 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 you know, and, and just that slight nuance right there will straighten things out when people start to um, have these kinds of discussions about uh, DNA and the gradients that people see, um, you know, with, with who they match. And then, and then they'll know, you know, that, that they only go back a certain amount of generations through the autosomes. Then you get your haplogroups, uh, your haplotype uh, back and so on and so forth. People really don't understand what that means. So, um, yeah, if you don't mind, um, I think your test was 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 cool because you went like uh, what do you call it? You went outward and showed the closeness in comparison. Like um, this thing, this person is closer to this than this person, or they're closer to each other than than this other uh, 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 you know person yeah, being tested or whatever. I, um, I had someone who was like. 98% European, 2% African. I had myself, who is one third European, and a friend of mine who's like, I think, 82 or 85% African. Mm -hmm. And it's like the West African mostly that African Americans have. But yeah, I, I'd love to go in, um, go in deeper on that because. It's like you're saying 23 and me only goes back i think eight generations but you can use their data and run tests with get match that yeah yeah go back deeper so right right like it opens up, up a lot of things just having a, a new 23 and me test um, yeah 20 yep they, they accept 23 and me yeah, um, there's, yeah, there's other ones ancestry.com yeah a lot of them you can upload for for um for free or for some fee. Uh, I'm I have mine in Jedmatch as well, 
and that's where you know you go back deeper um where i have east african um affinities kenya to be specific and i'm like okay you know so but anyway but uh but yeah that's cool but i don't want to um uh hog 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 the mic i know i'm sorry one more thing. okay go ahead and uh that's just that a lot of what you brought up today was stuff that I forgot because early on when I was studying Fassetti, I saw a lot of these examples. Um, and just that Fassetti, the fact that you said like it's in Nubia, it's in what Egyptology called Negro land. And it's the first known that they list out. Now, I don't know how that it, it, um, actually happened um was it the first one why is it the first is it just i guess it's order like going down the nile right remember but, that was their but that was their beginning resi resut we translate yeah. it as south but it's the head it's it's the it's the head the beginning and, and then your body one. yeah and your and body you know goes from the head down to your feet like we even say it today uh from your head down to your feet you know we always start with the head Head, nose, da, da, toes. Head, nose, and toes. We always <laughs> do that. So the head, which is resi, and then the, even the forehead or the nose, kinet or kinet, which is which is um the nose or whatever. That's also referring to the south. And so all these things in the in the head is is at the beginning. So why would they? This is for everybody out there who who claims to know but don't study jack. Why would the Egyptians call the 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 southern border their head the beginning they're literally telling you that's the beginning that goes into why i think that um the people that deny the african part are just as crazy like to me it's just double crazy and it's consistent until you realize that i think x is just sanborn like this is just he he really comes off just like any old old with it white supremacist and yeah. or maybe that's just what he defaults to like i don't know but i've seen others like him and that's what i recognize it as i mean unfortunately we got too many of them it's almost embarrassing i apologize in the tent we got some that are homegrown and we import them you know well these are the short yeah. bus chronicles right here so um <laughs> asam kai you had anything yeah, I, you know, I wanted to share my screen just so because you talked about this, and uh, I had yeah, I had, go ahead. Oh yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Let me do that. I had talked about it in a debate, but I also talked about it on an old podcast. But because you mentioned E. A. Wallace's words, let's just show the people what he said concerning, and then we'll give you the book that this is in. Let me make sure right, it's big right, enough. You, you, <laughs> yeah, you got to uh, blow it up a bit. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's uh, If you center, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So this is his words. And anybody who uses E.A. Wallace Budge or James Breasted, because James Breasted said some stuff with his racist self before he passed away, too, to correct himself. Um, let's just go in depth. Let's see. If you're going to use him... Know everything he said, because I just used this recently, and in 2008, I think it was, when I was doing the blog talk radio, I, we talked about Nahesi, the Nubia, so to speak, being the original, and Kemet is a byproduct. Um, But here, he goes in. This is E.A. Wallace Budge. He says, the chapters printed in these volumes are the result of a study undertaken with the object of attempting to discover the source of the fundamental beliefs of the indigenous religion of ancient Egypt, the indigenous, to trace their development through a period of some two score centuries and to ascertain what were the foreign influences which first modified Egyptian beliefs, then check their growth and finally overthrew them. Let's look and see. There is no doubt that the beliefs examined herein are of indigenous origin, Nilotic or Sudani in the broadcast signification of the word. And I have endeavored to explain those which cannot be elucidated in any other way. 
by the evidence which is afforded by the religions of the modern peoples who live on the great rivers of East, West, and Central Africa. So, and I'm a Congolese. I'm Congolese, Mali, Maasai, uh, and Cote d'Ivoire somehow. I don't know how the Cote d'Ivoire got in there, but shout out to Didier Drogba. He's telling you right here, for those who like to separate West and East Africa for no particular reason, um, and those who try to say that this comes from outside, it came from the indigenous in particular. No different than when you read the book of Coming Forth by Day, you see Asar is in Reset Jow, Asar is in Resi, Asar is always in the South, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But he goes further. He says, uh, I have endeavored to explain those which cannot be alluded. Yeah, we read that. He says, the central figure of the ancient Egyptian religion was Osar, and the chief fundamentals of his cult <clears throat> were the belief in his divinity, death, resurrection, absolute control of the destinies of the bodies and souls of men. The central point, each Osarian's religion was his hope of resurrection. He goes in on the resurrection. Then we get down here a little bit. Let's go down here. I have therefore made Osiris and the beliefs which grew under his cult the central consideration of his inquiry and have grouped about the history of the God, the facts in modern African religions, which are similar and which I consider to cognate to the old beliefs. So he's telling you these are indigenous, but he gets in depth he starts to go in depth he says the magical religious and mythological texts written by native egyptians for egyptians accounts of the magic religion mythology and gods of ancient egypt written by greek and roman historians and philosophers herodotus theodore Siculus, plutarch apuleius etc homer you can go on he says they make a mistake concerning he says they're good but they make a mistake and then he goes on to tell you more about this being pretty much Sudani religion. And all you had to do, all you had to do is open this free book, Osiris and the Egyptian Resurrection. Yep, EA Wallace Budge. <laughs> in your face. <laughs> nah, that's not how they say, in your face. But right. And see, and see, like I said, when people watch the video I shared, right, the uh, Stuart, uh, let me get his name again. His name is Stuart Smith uh, on YouTube. Stuart Smith does an excellent job at, at walking through that timeline. He, he shows the overt racism. Uh, you could take your, let me take your thing off. Here we go. Okay. He, he, he discusses the overt racism. And then he shows how how there's a gradient shift. And so, you know, he mentions Budge. He mentions Breasted. He mentions Reisner. Um, he mentions Petri, um, you know, and all these guys that leads up to today where you have scholars that are outright saying, listen, these early Egyptologists were racist. They took Egypt out of Africa and they used race to do it. I played it. Everybody heard it. These it's are not black book. folks saying it. You know what? I, I'm going I'm to let you go in, right? But there's a book with E.A. Wallace Budge. I think me and you uh, looked at it a long time ago. He says the Nubians, the, the, the people in the Hesse are white. And he draws a picture of them being like the white kind of cave dude, the Egyptian being regal white dudes, and then everybody is either Asian or a white dude. They almost took Nubia out of africa <laughs> he said they almost took doobie they 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 had two scoops of of, of cocoa puffs huh? <laughs> not one scoop two scoops of cocoa puffs yeah but 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 yeah so i but the point you know I, I i wanted to make the point and i showed i ended it by showing those non-black people saying everything that we say we've been saying for years that egypt is in africa Egypt's everything we know and love about Egypt to this very day has its genesis in the region called Nubia. And I made I make that clear. And I, I keep iterating that Nubia is not a country. It was never a country. It is a region that overlaps 
multiple countries, in this case, southern Egypt and northern Sudan, just like the Middle East is a region that encompasses Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Israel, you know, Iran, whatever, whatever. And so it's a region. And so this region uh, uh, is, is what gave birth or, or was major contributors, because I can't we can't deny the other elements that that contribute. But it was the major contributing factors to the state formation of what we now call Tawi, Kemet, Egypt, ancient Egypt, the black land, whatever. That's where it is from Nakata, which is now Kom Ombo all the way down to Kostul and further down that area was was is where all of it was on and popping and so again let me say this again when me and the brother Jonathan Owen leave it right there yep yep go ahead Joe. Uh oh, he dropped off for a second. Yeah, I, <laughs> I was wondering if it was me or not. <laughs> Look like he got one of them old brother aunt plans on the internet plans. <laughs> yeah, throttle. just use the dial up for three ninety nine. <laughs> Ujau, you on that Obama phone? You the <laughs> Obamacare phone. What's the new one? The Canelo phone? We <laughs> got a Canelo phone. Yeah, they just started <laughs> that. He's doing this. <laughs> Indeed. Go on, brother Emmatep. Go in on. <laughs> yeah, I forgot how thorough that that quote was from from E. A. Wallace Budge. I didn't even read it all. I'm, it's more like lower when he's like, I was convinced when I went into the Sudan that it was clearly from the religious. And I'm like, this dude just peeled it open. But I thought he might go into James Breasted's uh, books, the histories uh, in the in the uh, the fourth book. You have the brother. Um, uh, what's his name? Not Shabaka. It's the other brother, I believe. He says, we're finally back on the throne, the originate. He makes a statement like that, like the originals are back on the throne after all this time. So it's just, uh, it's it's so many different things that point to the South. It's, uh, it's crazy. Go on, brother. I wish. Go on for a second. Let me get the mic. Yeah. Um. I, was, I forgot what, he had a really saying though is if you practice voodoo, Egypt is basically your mecca. Yeah. So what else would there be that represents your style of religion this bold, <laughs> like this this thorough? I mean it's it's so exposed. You know, it's, it's between that and Benin, I guess. Yeah, I mean, nobody even points out, like, no one points out the simple stuff, you know. The Maasai talk about the Necha Kap, you know, the word Shuma'a, uh, the Kalenjin, when Asar Emetep talks about them. Or I just pulled out the other day the Khoi San, uh, the Khoi. Uh, there's a, 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 a location in northern Kemet called Kasut. And you find their bodies in the graves and everybody called and it was called Koi Land at one time. 
Um, so there's all there's all types of different things when you really start to peel things back where you don't really have uh you don't really have anywhere to go because when we start talking about Khoisan history, we, we go back 70,000 BC to the moving snake deep in the south, and they walk and somehow make their way up into ancient Egypt. So it couldn't have come from outer locations like Asia, as they uh, try to say in some of the books that EA and James Breasted wrote before. Uh, you know, they changed, they, they had a change of heart all of a sudden. And I believe it was because they they uh didn't get paid for a particular situation. But uh that's another story. I wondered about that. That's probably it. Because um didn't, I'm I'm back, um, y'all. Here you go. Have a change of heart too, huh? Yeah, basically. <laughs> Yeah, they, they probably... It was a little spat in Egyptology. People forget the Egyptology, uh, the Egyptologists go out, and I said this a long time ago, they only go to ancient Egypt to find biblical sources. When they're looking for biblical sources, they're taking it from the ancient Egyptian text in, in most cases, with no disrespect to anyone who reads the Bible. This is why they were sent out. That's what they're funny. paid to do. Yeah, so I'm, I'm back, y'all. Sorry about that. Uh, something, the internet connection. Boy, I tell you, man, uh, 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 Chief X, the Hegelite, must have sent some Hegel, some Hegel storm. He sent some Moringa juju. Yeah, some Moringa juju. Yep. That's what he sent, some Moringa juju. Oh, sorry, you were to share? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, just something quickly uh, to, to piggyback on what... Um, Okay, Brother yeah, Sar you... was talking about in terms of little things that may mean big things. You know, if 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 you know anything about African culture, and okay, you got it. You got it up. Way. Yeah. Okay, let me pull it. Let me. Uh, it looked like you sharing the um the stream though. I know. I'm just. I just got to pop it up. So this is this is what I'm. Oh, there we go. So. Uh, this is an image of the ideal schema of a Dogon village, right? And uh, one thing that I know about a few African societies is that the traditional village and even sometimes the traditional home is modeled after an ideal human being right so this again this is just a conceptual plan of a a village so at the top the the quote-unquote north part is is the head you know it says men's meeting house head and then on the left and right hand sides of the the borders of the village uh or represents the hands then you have, you know, kind of the stone for oil crushing in the center and the village altar. These are conceptually, you know, the genitalia because kind of feminine and masculine in this respect here. But this is what's significant here. The altars, the ancestral altars and shrines are at the feet, the bottom. And when you, you look at ancient Kemet's, uh, ideal body plan for, for its its structure. It's it's kind of uh, positioned in a similar way. So as y'all were saying, the 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 south for them, you know, this would be flipped. So the 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 south for them would be you know Dogon North, and the north for them would be Dogon South. But you notice that. You know the 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 pyramids i argue are essentially shrines um and in in burial mounds uh or ideal you know ideally like supposed to be burial mounds and so they 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 match cognitively with you know tombs uh word for tombs and graves uh among other african languages but the vast majority of if not all 
of the pyramids are towards the north of of egypt uh our orientation north so you have the head and then the you know the altars at the feet so you you have them at the feet because of the 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 conceptual reference to the ancestors and and the ground so they're they're always buried you know um or the shrines at least not necessarily the burial because uh in in most cases they would bury the the ancestors below the home um and but you know the 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 kings are however usually buried in some kind of elaborate tomb and or they're put into a mountain that's kind of common like a, a a hill or a mountain in in africa um but it's you know if we consider the pyramid shrines and the fact that they're even located for the most part in the south like you know when you talk about the pyramids of giza and all that that's in the you know um in the in the delta area or close to the delta area in cairo you know and and then the pyramids are all along you know that way and so you you know the oldest pyramids are probably be a little bit towards the middle but then one could argue that that is because you know the borders were were a little bit closer you know in terms of the end and so like when you think about resu being the beginning and then mehu i argue is is um the the word for end because it's it's we we know there's there's a there's a homonym or a homograph of the word for like marshes and things of that nature, but it's also there's a word for like to be full complete, and words for like full complete are the words for end. So it's just like the word Kim, in Kimit, um, or just Kim. It's a, I should say that you know there's a word for to to end to be complete etc. Um, the edge. And so they're they're letting you know you know what is the head or what is the beginning and what is the end and so you get the the reference of the names uh of these two regions but you know if this correspondence is is correct this may be some indirect uh evidence you know at least for a common african conceptualization of their living space in terms of it being a you know a representative of a human body and then the head being the beginning and then the feet being the end and and the common the large shrines also being at uh primarily located at the foot of the of the of the ideal village and so that's all i wanted to share absolutely You got that picture where they show uh, that I think it's it's an older book. They outlined the town in red. It's like the shape of a natural. The Egyptians. Yeah. Or the, okay. Um, no, I don't. I don't have that. And and also the the uh, the Dogon, they. Uh, divide their village into upper and lower yep. and uh the the there is divided by colors in terms of red and white and what the red is supposed to uh represent is the uh the the orientation and the not orientation but the the success in cattle herding right and the white with agriculture and we know that you know uh, egypt is also divided into north and south and the the north you know we go by the red crown is um the upper egypt is represented by the white crown and then the lower egypt is represented by the red and lower egypt is where primarily the cattle raising and everything because that that has the um the the most lush land and that's where you would see all of the kind of nomadic pastoralists 
uh, coming out of, you know, North Africa and the Middle East passing through all the time. Um, and so, um, but, you know, the, the, the agriculture was primarily along the Nile um, throughout, you know, the, the edges of the banks. But, um, and, but even, either way it goes, you know, in terms of the, the white crown and the association with Osiris, who is the patron saint of agriculture. And, you know, so that may uh, have some significance as well in terms of a probably a, a, a common uh, framework in terms of viewing the society. So far, I've only been able to find that amongst the Dogon in Egypt. But if we find others, you know, it may it may uh, provide, you know, indirect evidence to a common schema that maybe, you know, was was present during the Green Sahara. Yo, definitely point to so, orientation for sure. But everything y'all just saying right there, man, that's blackology, boy. That's blackology. Mm -hmm. uh, y'all y'all trying to be Egyptians. Y'all trying to make Egyptians <laughs> you, you Egyptians. Egypt is really white. <clears throat> Those black Negroes is in the South. And and y'all don't have any feelings. Y'all don't have any consciousness. Y'all y'all can't even think outside yourself of individualism. Why? Because I am Hegel. I am a Hegelite, and my name is Chief um, X. Did you have that? What uh, video did you have that had the trade routes? Do you remember? It was it was today. You remember what we oh, the, oh oh the video that I was showing that showed the trade routes. Yeah. Yeah, I was sharing yeah. that was that was that was one of the three videos I shared. It was it was I, I think forgot it was, about that, but the, one of them trade routes looks like the one that Robert Duval found that was going to Yale. And yeah, in, in, yeah. in that um video I have on my channel that, that comes from that study that used the um archaeological sites and carbon dating to create like a population density map you can see that that heating up on, around that trade route so I, I was just thinking about that with osar bringing up the connection with the dogon and the green sahara that, okay, that's yeah, a trade yeah, route. Yeah. like you can see it in that that, that simulation and then that, that video you had earlier i'm just surprised to see it because i didn't think it existed until Robert Duvall's Black Genesis, but, but I mean, he probably had a lead to go by. He probably didn't discover it. I'm just still, I'm surprised that it was, that it was in there. But it's that, that route going down to the, and it even says it, it's going to the Chad um, Lake, that lake in Chad. Because that place blows up in the Green Sahara. There's a lot of people living there. Um, yeah, I don't know um, if you can see, if you can share the screen that I, uh, I'm presenting. I just wanted to, to emphasize um, something that, you know, we've talked about and um, just coming out of the, you know, uh, dropping the word Nubian itself because how um, it is, it has been used in the past by uh, Egyptologists and, and, and then uh, people taking that over. And, you know, because uh, this is the white Nubia, um, uh, you know, that you see on your screen here for the place. Uh, you also have uh, the Nubians, the white uh, for the Nubians on this other end. But you'll notice that, um, you know, when it comes to that particular white seti itself, um, you know, in this instances, it is translated as Nubia. But in, in you know, when you when you start to kind of look, you know, into more into the words that you can, you know, uh, the, the glyphs themselves and how it's used in in in, um, in in other different areas. Like when you're looking at the, the root word itself, you kind of find that um, you get to understand why it is um, not correct to actually translate the translate it to the word Nubia, which, you know, is pretty much another word for saying Negro or black. Because um, in other instances, it could actually mean like uh, like Uja was talking about, um, you know, um, stabbing or or, 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 or or you know, you know, uh, yeah, like pretty much like stabbing. You can also see like where it actually translates to like, um, you know, uh, ochre, 
uh, which will be like the color, it could be like a reddish color or a yellowish color. You don't see anywhere where it actually has any semantic uh, value that's almost close to, to the word black as, as how um, early Egyptologists have actually used it. And when you look at actually even the way the, um, because this this particular glyph itself is actually the word that uh, is for uh, for Ta City itself. I know some people have argue, argued about uh, why is it called uh, the land of the bows when it's like an arrow. Why didn't they call it like uh, 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 Pajet, I believe? But that's because this particular word is is actually it's a logogram for Ta City itself. When you see it being used in other areas like here, where it's like um, it's actually for the Iwenti and the, and and it's used here. Um, you will see it not being translated in regards to uh, particular people's race or color, but actually certain things that make make up a culture, like uh, what they do, like that the bowmen. And, and you will see this particular word here. Actually, if you see it clearly in this other area where it's uh, Iwenet, where it actually describes the word bow, hence where the the word bowman comes from, and he, and also here where we know it as the, the land of the bow. So that's why we always try to say that we should drop actually that word Nubia because it's actually superimposed into something that has nothing to do with that, but actually describing the particular people and the, and the, and the customs and what they're known for, as opposed to their um, race or their culture, or I mean race or their skin color, as you know, most people would like us to believe. But yeah, just, um, you know, wanted to show that while, um, you know, emphasizing on that point. Correct. Excellent, excellent. And I, I just want to quickly share this again. This is what uh, 42 Tribes, which you were referring to, um, the video, Stuart Smith, uh, Black Pharaohs, Egyptological Bias, Racism, and Egypt and Nubia as African Culture. So he shows the trade routes and, and such and such. All right. So definitely check out that video. Everybody gave you all some you homework. Can, you can also um, note the fact that um, it is my argument that even the, the God set is based upon those set of glyphs that you just showed, uh, Sister Emiket. Because when you think about the fact that, uh, like, for example, you have that uh, he went to you, tribesmen, bowmen, nomads, right? Mm -hmm. That the the bow is a symbol itself for the or you know like how it has the like that um that what's the name stick there as well uh in set to you um for you know these kind of warrior nomads and um when you think about set and his his uh tail association with foreigners like set is associated with foreigners and nomadic groups and and this is probably the original group um from which the concept of set you know because set is pre-dynastic um mm. that or you know that it originates from those quote unquote uh nubians and then it was just kind of applied uh you know more broadly as you know the pharaonic egyptian uh and and isn't isn't it something isn't it something that set is the is the uh deity over the place called noob <laughs> yeah gold town <laughs> and then also but but now check this out in the story satuk or set acts like a nomadic person behavior wise because mm -hmm. he comes in to an already established sedentary people with osir on the throne his wife or set osir goes out and does his thing he comes in like a nomad and it comes and does a hostile takeover that's just mm -hmm. what nomadic uh, raiders did at, at at those times. So the whole foreign thing, you know, is 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 um connected there. The whole story, and then obviously he fights um as well. So the warrior aspect. Yeah. You bring that up, and then we also have a myth, and I'm not sure how myth this part is because it says King of Pep worshipped only Set and stop worshiping other nature rule and i'm trying to pull it up right now <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a myth though but uh no no that's, that's... because we're well, talking about the foreign hikaka suit when they come in and they yeah. he would only give tribute to set so uh oh king of yeah Pep, but they're well, too apophis yeah they're one good. of the peps because remember there's a 
a few of peps. There's a few yeah. uh stats King, King that come with that. Yeah, yeah. King of Paphos. Well, we, yeah, we can call him Apophis. Yeah. Ip Ip. Now but 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 well, remember Set Ramsey's father, um, his name was Seti, which means he of Set. So so yeah. it wasn't always a, a, a definitely always wasn't a bad thing. And and remember, uh King Seti the first did his thing. Like like he yes. people sleeping on him. You know Seti got busy he, busy. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> he got busy busy. But it's not that particular Seti. This is just a, a set. I think it's uh I, I think this is it right here, right? The beginning no, I, I, was, I was just no that's what we got, bro. I was just saying um, that that people people will will have names that will reflect this. So I was saying Seti uh, is is he he of Set, and then you have a, a Pep or Apophis, as they say, which was a real person, um, you know, after Pep and stuff. So yeah, yeah. People forget that Set was worshipped by the Nehesi, and that he was a righteous nature, and. Uh, probably one of the reasons why the Egyptians uh, never kick him out of the fold. And if you look at the whole story, after Set does all that stuff and Heru drags him through the land and he's screaming out wild stuff, naming the locations in ancient Kemet, they forget that he's revivified and Asar calls him and uh, uh, Ampu to uh defend the boat he calls them together when you look at the i think it's the ed food text that talks about it in particular and this is when set all of a sudden is regenerated as a hero again in the stories mm -hmm. and in the tales but uh yeah protecting ra and his night well, you, you gotta understand as well that you know this is kind of where the culture comes in and paranimi and the Rabus principle and all of that good stuff. Because when you start looking at words that are uh, graphically the same and or similar to set or you know some other titles that he is known by, it, it has a wide range of things. And I think that uh, a, wide, a wide range of meanings. And I think that as a result of paranimi and they're trying to sync all of these words together, um, that you have this kind of schizophrenic uh, representation throughout time of set because you know, and um, on one hand, he's he's you know with the spear and he's uh, battling Apep, uh, you know. And then on the other one, he is you know uh, kind of the personification of homosexuality and and violence and and all this other kind of stuff but that's because there's words that match that um the those consonant sequences with those with those names excuse me with those uh respective meanings and you know it's it's very like we like for example there's a word like if you know anything about there's many different words, for example, for crocodile, and then the the the, the derived uh, meanings of the word for crocodile in terms of savage and stuff like this. There's many words that just for the regular word crocodile, and then you also see the word for uh, you also see that this is associated a representation of set, right? But people keep forgetting there's a word seti that means crocodile. You know, there's also a word seti that means to scatter. And and we know that in African languages, the word for to scatter is also used to mean confusion. You know, it has like that derived metaphoric association with confusion. Mm -hmm. So to scatter. Then you have seti fiery one, right? Which could mm -hmm. which could also be uh associated with, you know, uh, a certain type of uh, aggressive you know behavior as as i've shown in other uh conversations that the word for fire you know with certain prefixes and suffixes then becomes the word for destruction for violence etc etc and then, anger exactly and then you have set um i'll say seta for you know uh lowercase s 
lowercase t capital a right it means protector then you have sateshi to drive away then you have seti of course shooter and archman and so when you start looking at all of these different variations and you also have set he s-t-h-i uh, to pervert to cause obstruction and then you have satehet to rot and then of course satech uh seth itself so when you see all of these different variations and, and of course set chi to you meaning asiatics mm -hmm. once you see all of these words that sound or is is spelled similarly and you understand you know the ancient concept of paronymy you'll see why for example seti has all of these different orientations and these these different stories because they're trying to uh link up all of these different aspects based upon the similarity of all these words yep so you know what set... go ahead i'm sorry no 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 go ahead no, no, I was just saying, so when you see uh, Set driving away a pep, that's because there's a word, Sateshi, to drive away. And there's also a word, Satesh. Satesh being an alternative form of the word, Satek, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, of the, the sh and the ch sound interchange in, uh, in Egyptian, it's dialectical. And so, you know, we got to always keep that in mind as well. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say what's also interesting is um, the Egyptian view of of their southern neighbors. And what I showed earlier was was, you know, this this area that are that people call Nubia as a region was was fruitful for for the state formation and, and everything and all that good stuff. But what's interesting is that even today, right, the United States of America, we allow in this country, we allow different uh immigration you know different people coming um from different countries or whatever the case is but at certain at a certain point even in our lifetime we have vilified middle east middle easterns like yeah. if you if you if you look at all the movies at a certain point at a certain time frame all of the villains were arabs you know terrorists they you know they were known as terrorists villains this that a third it was the arab uh look or muslim type of thing to the point where where you get on a plane somebody looks suspicious they you know somebody get on a, i mean I don't, I don't i don't get on planes but if somebody get on a plane and they and they got a a, a jellabia and a and a, and a hodge and everything on you like oh shucks man am I, am I gonna have to get up off this plane or something like that i mean no seriously it's funny but it was scary like that yeah but but hold up but what i'm the point i'm making is that even though in in a national caricature or i should say stereotype because caricatures for drawings and stuff but a stereotypic uh national view was was a villain and a terrorist we still allowed obviously uh arabs to come in the country become citizens and there's a lot of arabs you know that live here you know and everything's all good well in egypt they vilified the nahisiu the nahisiu but yet at the same time, and this this is something that was pointed out by Emily Teeter, I think, uh, in one of the videos, that while they were vilifying on a national level of, of the Nahisiu, they also allowed them, you know, allow people to come. They married people who had jobs in Egypt from 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 these territories and the whole nine. So it's, it's a very similar phenomenon that that uh, we can connect for how we what we do today and then how they did it. Uh, as attested in the text, you know, because they they talk down on Nehisiu at per, at certain points, but then you got Nehisiu with Egyptian names and Egyptians with marrying Nehisiu folks and and the whole nine, you know, all the time. So so I think that that's interesting that that um that we still do that to this very day. Yeah, I think it almost stems from like when you talk about Set. Um, remember they they always you you mentioned seti associating it with hit remember he hits his mother's stomach and they use the word uh seti in the mythos um for him to actually be the first c-section so he c-sections his way out of nuke and he's the third child after uh asar and elder heru 
and then the girls come out as twins. But uh, uh, a set comes out first, and the bet hat comes out last. But I did find the uh, the story. This is the call of Apophis and Second Ra, right? And so they set it up. They give a little preface in this beginning. It says, for, for nearly a century, Asiatic Hyksos rulers and their vassals had dominated Egypt, controlling the Delta and Middle Egypt. This fragment of a Ramesseed historical romance presents the origins of the conflict between Thebes and the South and the Hyksos King Apophis at a time when Thebes was still tributary to the Hyksos. King Apophis seeking to agitate the Theban ruler Second Ra sends a fantastic comp complaint regarding a hippopotamus saying they're loud as hippopotamus. So this also would kind of uh, play into what you discussed about the, the Nehesi. All of a sudden the Asiatics said the same thing about the Egyptians. And it, uh, it, it plays out like this. And this is where you see the worship of Set. This is where you also see him call the, the Egyptians noisy and chatty like hippopotamus chatter. It says, uh, it came here. Let me just share real quick. That way y'all can see it. So it's just not me talking. It says, uh, here it is. It came to pass that the land of Egypt was in misery as there was no Lord, life, strength, and health, Uncle Justin, uh, functioning as a proper king of the time. It happened that King Second Ra, Uncle Justin, was but ruler, Uncle Justin, of the southern city, southern city. And misery was in the city of the Asiatics, while Prince Apophis, Uncle Jasineb, was in Avaris, and the entire land paid tribute to him, delivering their taxes in full, as well as bringing all good pro produce to Egypt. And this is where he's worshiping Set only, right here. He says, so King Apophis adopted Set for himself as Lord, and he refused to serve any god that was in the entire land except Set. He built a temple of fine workmanship for eternity next to the house of the king Apophis, Uncle Jasineb, and he appeared at break of day in order to sacrifice daily to Set, while the officials of the palace carried garlands exactly as it practiced in the temple of pre horaketi And then he goes on to uh, say they're chatty like hippopotamuses down here lower. Where is it at? He gets mad at him. So you can see the foreign kings are always associated with uh, Set. And in particular, they say that this king, there it goes right there. This king worshipped them. But right here says, then the prince of the southern city became stupefied for a long while, remaining unable to remember render a reply to the messenger of King Apophis. The prince of the southern city said to him, is it, th is it through this remark that your Lord would investigate matters regarding the lagoon of hippopotamuses, which is in the east sector of the southern city? And he says that because up here he says, let there be a withdrawal from the lagoon of hippopotamuses, which is in the east sector of the city, because they don't let sleep come to me either in the daytime or at night for the noise of them is in his ears. He's calling them noisy hippopotamuses in that lagoon area while they're at war. And so yeah. they <laughs> that, that sounds um, very close to the destruction of mankind, uh, the book of the heavenly cow where uh, Ra couldn't is disturbed by humans. And, um, uh, he sends, uh, Het Heru who becomes Sekhmet Yep. to kill and 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 so on um so that's interesting it's interesting but listen y'all it is uh i'm on a it's late and I, I i think everybody else on the panel is not so <laughs> i am definitely about to uh wind this down because i was definitely long-winded tonight already and then you know y'all about to make me do a double shift so um anything closing though because you know I, I i basically i'm i'm done you know i'm all i'm all out i just right want to say something it. real quick that uh what brother uh asar says there's a a kind of a similar mythos in among the dogon in terms of uh 
the the pale fox, the Urugu, uh, coming out of the side of the womb of Ama uh, instead of being born naturally. That mm -hmm. that you know one may want to compare. Uh, nice and good. he is also you know the kind of the represent representation of chaos and deviancy in the Dogon lore. We'll ahead, that's interesting because no, that's interesting because in in the myth that uh, Asar you brought up. Um, that's where Satuk, that's one of the places that, that is focused on for Satuk's bad name because he disrupts the, the pair, uh, birth of pairs. You know, you have Nut, uh, 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 Shu and Tefnut as a pair, Geb Nut as a pair, and then he breaks that cycle by coming out as a C section um, in that particular myth. And, they, and you know, and you line up the words, you have uh, Satuk there for that actual act of. Um, of coming out as an unnatural birth and so he's like he's like that uh you know stepchild treated that way and 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 so he gets Red the bad rap yeah 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 so that's interesting um him get a bad rap but like Asar said through paranomy or whatever they're combining these different concepts so he becomes a protector he'd be like what it doesn't sound contradictory you know he's he's supposed to be evil but yet he's protecting Ra. And then you got a, a famous king who did his thing, named after him, Seti, and 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 you know all the stuff. And then he's the he's the deity over Nubit or Nupt, proudly. And then and then they show him, um, with a a ceremony with him and Heru, uh, anointing people. You know, tying tying the uh the the no. emblematic plants right. In, in different occasions so i mean that's what i'm saying listen so i'm gonna say this one more time this is grown folks conversation children need to stay out of it and i've got to say this again so let me just double back and, and summarize so chief x uh i'm using chief x as a case as a case uh use case from here on out i don't think chief x is going to get this because and i'm saying this unapologetically because I actually took time to explain this to him live with him before. And he's, and he saw my Facebook post from a long time ago and I, I revisited, reposted to him, tagged him in it and everything like that about, about the, this topics and stuff. But yet he still goes on and on and he just straight up lied and say that he used my name and, and, and our raw squad that we teach and we're trying to lead people to believe this that, and the third and that's just not true and i don't appreciate that i don't have anything against chief x so shout out to chief x but chief x do, stay in your lies. lane <laughs> chief x he, stay he, in your lane he's still lying yeah. that i made a, a facebook entry on negro egyptian and i'm referring to myself in third i, I changed my name and then i referred to asarim hotep in third party and then all of the citations about um uh negro egyptian are my references that if i was to reference it i would directly cite obinga or um Mboli. and it's mm -hmm. just made up lies like that it's like no i don't have respect for him he doesn't have integrity and you know so you you could say you cool i'm not it's it's just <laughs> it's just you know once you once you lie like him zion lex they just lie for no reason then then i i just don't respect you it just is what it is yeah chief x needs to stay in his lane though um but see here's the thing see he has a followers you know people watch him he's he's entertaining and you know i get it man so so i'm gonna use him as a use case if if the opportunity uh should present itself but um but yeah he just lied up and down and he's not going to get it he's not going to get it he is hell bent on remaining a victim of the modern social constructs of race but yet act like he's not by by you know it's almost that, that reverse psychology on himself like he's he's pulling a mojo on himself you know he's the one that believed ancient egyptians that he was an ancient egyptian he got tattoos of the god best and and the and the sun disc i 10 with the with the rays coming down everything all all over like come on like and then he named himself the God Best and everything like that. I don't have no tattoos or nothing, none of that. 
So I mean, who 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 was fooled and bamboozled? You know what I'm saying? So anyway, uh, this is grown folks talk. So when me and Jonathan get together and talk about uh, ancient Egypt and Nubia, we know what we're talking about. Chief X doesn't. All up in the Kool Aid and and all that stuff, man. So this is grown folks talk. It's not for not for uh, uh, children. And so it's a lot of people like that though. So I'm I'm, I'm pointing out Chief X because he mentioned you know because he did his video and mentioned me and didn't even play the video just showed the title and 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 i mean he made all kinds of assumptions just from a title <laughs> uh, that's crazy but uh anyway i hope everybody enjoyed and learned something tonight and had fun um so i am definitely out i'll see y'all next time uh when we do this drive-by so um yeah y'all be easy on the panel appreciate everybody tuning in asar both asars and 42 yeah i'm gonna get with you see if you want to um, just go over uh, the points with your with that DNA that that um, the commentary you gave, that's interesting. Yeah, well, um, person on Facebook. Just message me. Okay, yeah, yeah, yep, I'll do that definitely. So, all right, all right. So, I see y'all, man. Uh, ETM. I mean, I say ETM Hotel, Sherman Hotel, and I see y'all. Good in the field. Sherman, see y'all. <laughs> all right, Hotel, Hotel. Plato said that when you go to chemist school, you became more alert, you, you made a wake up, your spirit wake up, and you became a more human being, that's your character is built in a school. Sure.